through this all goofy stuff at the end. Uh, how much I've enjoyed working with everybody and uh, morning, Senator Hutchings and and. Good morning, sir, gentlemen. Ladies. Chairman, it's been a direct pleasure to work with you. A distinct pleasure to work with you as chairman. So, wish you all the best, and uh, wish everybody else all the best. And we've got a what I would call a significant agenda. So I think we need to go to work. Yes, we do. Thank you, sir. With that, can we have roll call, please? Senator Ellis. Present. Senator Hutchings. Here. Senator Landon. Here. Senator Lapis. Here, and Josh, we can barely hear you. So, don't know where my mic is exactly. <laughs> uh, Representative Brown. Here. Representative Connolly. Here. Representative Flitner. Here. Representative Freeman. Here. Representative Obermuller. Here. Representative Paxton. Here. Representative Peperinen. Here. Representative Simpson. Here. Uh, Co-Chairman Co Coe. Here. Co-Chairman Northrop. Here. We have a quorum. Thanks, Josh. So just as a matter of housekeeping, uh, Karen's going to be keeping us on track with the people that are waiting in the room to be giving us public input on these bills that are coming up. Also, um, these bills have quite a bit of, of, uh, stuff in them and i want to just say that don't repeat yourself to the public i'd also say that especially this one on suicide prevention and information that um this is being recorded this is actually a permanent record and those people that want to comment probably should be mindful of that and not say anything that they don't want out there for the rest of eternity and not too much detail because we have a lot of people that would like to actually present something for that there's 11 people in the waiting room and so thanks karen for keeping us on track and we will go to josh we're going to do... mr chairman are we live on youtube did we go live okay that's just what i was checking on so we'll go to josh for consideration of draft legislation 221 lso dash 0188 version three suicide prevention. It's all yours, Josh, take it away. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so Mr. Chairman, um, as you note, this is 21 LSO 188 version 0 0.3. Uh, this uh, bill request came out of our last meeting. Um, um, if you'll remember, we had some discussions at the end there. Um, related to the Jason Flat Act and expanding on that. And so what this bill does, Mr. Chairman, it creates a new uh, section uh, 219-105 suicide prevention instruction, uh, provides that a school district may include suicide prevention instruction um, in a health and safety program uh, required under uh, 219101B1G, that's the Common Core of Knowledge for Health and Safety, it says the school district may provide instruction in an appropriate manner, uh, provided that the instruction shall be consistent with suicide prevention education materials under 212202A and training under 213110A. And those are both uh, the provisions of the existing uh, Jason Flat Act. Um, and with that, I stand for any questions, Mr. Chair. Questions for Josh from the committee? We'll approve the minutes when we get done with the bill. I did skip over it. Thank you, Representative Flintner. So any questions for Josh? One more time. All right. Go ahead, Senator Hutchins. Thank you, um, Mr. Co-Chair. When I this question is for Josh. When I look at this bill, it's small, and I see the word they may include this. 
do you know what would happen if they don't include this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Wait. Senator Hutchings, um, yeah, as this is drafted, it's just a, a, a permissive bill. It allows school districts to do this. It doesn't require them to do so. Um, right. So there would be nothing that would occur if they didn't provide this. Uh, and this mirrors um, the 219104, which is uh, related to child sexual abuse prevention. So uh, this is kind of was modeled after that provision. Um, certainly nothing uh, policy choice if you wanted to to require this, but right now it's written as a permissive. I got that. What I'm asking is, since it's a May, is it, um, from what I gather, they cannot do this if they don't have this in there, in our statute? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think school districts in general have, uh, you know, the ability to, to tailor their, uh, their instruction, you know, they have fairly broad discretion. Um, this just makes it clear that this would be something they would be encouraged to do and, and directs them to match it up to the, to the Jason Flat Act. Okay, thank you. Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think what Senator Hutchings is trying to get at, and I think I, I'd like to know the same thing when we hear from public comment, um, is this legislation truly necessary? Do we really need to write a bill, uh, hash it out on the floor, go through three readings in each chamber to do something that they may or may not already be able to do? So if, if the people in the waiting room that are listening to this would be able to answer that, that would be helpful for me as well. Senator Hutchins, would you like to continue? Yes, uh, co-chair. I would like to thank uh, our <laughs> representative Brown. That's exactly where I was going. I'm not as eloquent all the time, but why do we need to write a bill to say you can teach kids about not committing suicide? Why don't we just do it? So that's exactly where I was going. So thank you, Representative Brown. Very good. Further comments? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to note, uh, Senator Hutchings, uh, it's very difficult to hear you right now. Um, even though we can hear you, the, the volume's a lot lower than I, I think it probably is intended to be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hutchins. Senator Ellis, you had a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just um, for the presenters, I, yeah, I just want to know how many districts currently have suicide prevention programs in their districts and their schools um, as we go forward and evaluate this legislation. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. Go ahead, Representative Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And then I'll just add on a question for all of the presenters. As we know, we've gotten dozens of email messages about this particular bill. And it seems to me that their argument is that, in fact, they want to change the, the may on line 10 to a shall. So it will be obligatory in a health and uh, safety class. And so if they would address that in their testimony, I won't have to ask it to every one of them. Thank you. Good job, thank you. Further comments or questions? Anybody? All right, then let's take some public input. Karen, who's up first? Mr. Chairman, we're going to begin by hearing from Daniel Kosovun. He's the one who brought this information to the committee previously. And then I know that uh, he's with Park 6. And then we've got some other representatives from that particular district that we'll hear from before we move on to other districts and other organizations. All righty. Well, I'm sure Daniel will be on here in just a minute then. Daniel, you're now with the committee. Daniel, please can start when you feel like you're ready. Sure. Can Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Um, first of all, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Great. So, uh, 
First of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of the committee. Um, I really appreciate that uh, we can discuss this very, very important topic uh, here in Wyoming. My name is Daniel Cosco and I'm the school psychologist at Cody High School. And I did address the committee before um, to talk about this concept of amending the Jason Flat Act to include suicide prevention training for students in Wyoming grades six through 12. And I did present uh, quite a bit of research and suicide statistics in terms of why we really need to address it. Um, and I, I think most people are pretty familiar with those statistics at this point. Um, and in 2020, um, those statistics have not changed. Up to this point in 2020, and this is according to the Wyoming Health Rankings, uh, suicide continues to be the leading cause of death in Wyoming for ages 15 to 24. Uh, it's also the leading cause of death for ages 25 to 34, and the leading cause of death for ages 35 to 44. And so I think it's abundantly clear that we have a public health issue on our hands um, that I'm hoping can be addressed uh, through, through some legislation. So the other reason I'd like to speak before the committee is, is to try and inform the committee that suicide is the number one preventable health risk. Um, if we can identify a student who is um, thinking about suicide or who is acutely suicidal, if once they're identified, if we can wrap a plan of care around them, create a safety plan, get them referred to the proper people, the mental health professionals, psychiatrists, uh, especially their friends and their family to gather that support around them, largely in most cases, suicide is a preventable tragedy. Um, and with the Jason Flat Act as it currently is, um, since it's been passed in 2014, our teen suicide rates have actually um, increased substantially. And the hypothesis with that is, is that um, we're not including the kids in our suicide prevention and training. As it is right now, the Flat Act is only including employees. Um, but when you study it out, the adolescents are going to tell their friends 80% of the time before they actually engage in self-harm like that. The problem is that sometimes it just stops right there because the kids haven't adequately been taught how, what to do and how to cope with the situation and how to, to refer their friends so that we can get that safety plan in place and potentially save their lives. Um, I, can, I can tell you personally that the Jason Flat Act has absolutely saved students' lives because of the teacher training that has been received. Um, I've gone through that several times and the teachers are better able to recognize when a student is suicidal, whether it be a student's talking with them or they're writing an essay and, they, and they're starting to say some dark things. The teachers now know exactly what to do in order to identify that and immediately bring the student to get the proper referral and the safety plan uh, in place. And so I can testify to you today, assuredly the Jason Flat Act has literally saved lives. There's no question about that. Um, but I do think we need to extend it. Um, we've had cases in the past when tragically the suicide has happened when I'm counseling students in two out of the three cases in, in Park County I was counseling students who told me that, in fact, the person who took their life told them that they were going to do it, but they didn't know what to do with that information. They thought they were doing the right thing by protecting that person's trust, and in fact, it ended in tragedy. Um, and I think that kind of, that, that falls on us as a system to address that issue, to give these kids the skills that they need in order to properly deal with something like that. Um, and again, if you go back to the literature, what it'll show is that kids who have been properly trained through a scientific evidence-based program, and we do have people who can testify to some of those programs today, um, it decreases suicidal behavior, including the number of completed suicides. So the, the programs do work and they've got some pretty decent science behind them. Um, it also, the, these programs show that if it's done with fidelity, um, 
it increases health-seeking behavior and increases appropriate referrals. So that's the identification process. That's the process that's absolutely critical that we constantly miss in Wyoming, which is why we end up being on that, that top five list year after year after year for over a decade now. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk to the committee about today is trying to address some roadblocks because some, some issues got brought up and rightfully so. Um, one of the issues was money, which we all know in Wyoming, we, we're, we're gonna face some budget crunches that are pretty serious. Um, but currently what's going on is that suicide prevention monies are already allocated at the, at the county level. They already exist. And with the Jason Flat Act, if we choose to amend it, what will happen is it will create a vehicle where students, or not students, pardon me, uh, school districts can access um, trainers at the county level to come into districts, provide the training at no cost to the district and asking for no other money from, from the state. Um, and we had that planned out through Wendy Morris, who is our prevention coordinate, coordinator here in Park 6. Um, the problem was, was, was COVID shut us down. She was scheduled to come into the high school and the middle school and train all our kids. Um, and we're still going to do that. It's just a matter of when public health gives us the okay to, for people to come in and start doing that training. The other thing that we're doing is she's going to train all of the school psychs, all the school counselors, to also be trainers in suicide prevention awareness. And when you look at it like that, the cost per student is about $2, which to me is money well spent. And I'm, I'm specifically talking about a QPR program. Um, and there's also some folks here uh, that can testify to how we would solve the problem of what this might cost a district, uh, Peg Monteith being one of them and, and Perkins being another. Um, so I think there are solutions to those roadblocks. Um, the other thing is teacher time. There was concern about this taking too much time in a classroom because as you all know, teachers are busy every, every minute of every, every day. And so it's, it's really important to protect that time. But when we look at programs, um, we're not asking the teachers to be trained, right? The, the, the counselors, the psychs will go in and provide the training, it's only gonna cost one class period. That's all we're asking, about an hour. And when I talk to the teachers around the state and specifically at Cody High, I have not yet had one teacher say, you know what, I'm not willing to give up one class period. They are gladly and willingly giving up that class period knowing that it is gonna save a student's life. So that, that's really, it, it truly is a non-issue. And we can do it very efficiently without interrupting instructional time. Um, Daniel, that's a, a great point. And I'm, I wish it, we could listen to more of your information. I would like to just kind of have you wrap it up. We have sure. 10 more people or 11 more people that would like to just had another one just ask if we could speak. So yes, 11 people waiting. Yeah, I apologize. So the, the last thing I, I would address is th this local control and Senator Hutchins asked about, is this mandatory? And, and right now it's not. Um, and I get that because in our Wyoming constitution, right? It, it says the power of the government lies with the people as it should. I believe that very, very strongly. At the same time, the people are asking for, the, for, for this legislation. They want this to happen and it, it can, it, there could be overwhelming numbers for this. Um, so I, I, I get how it's, it's a difficult balance between legislating this and making it required, whereas the, the, the legislators are being very careful not to overstep bounds. I, I, I get that and I appreciate the position that it puts you in. And I guess my, my comment to that would be, how did we do that already with the Jason Flat? It's accredited, it's tied to accreditation. And if we can figure out how to make it required, it would be a very, very helpful thing. Um, and right now we have overwhelming support for this. I think we received letters from the WPA, the, NS, the NASW, the YSCA, Park County School District Board, 
Park County Suicide Prevention Team, all others in attendance, but most importantly, the students. And I would hope um, with the chairperson that they, they would have an opportunity to, uh, to give their testimony today. So thank you for your time and um, that I, I'll, I'll conclude now. Thank you. Thank you, I guess we have a question. Go ahead, Representative Brown. Very quickly, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Dr. Kosselboom, very quickly, if you can just answer this with a direct yes or no question. Uh, is there any restrictions on being able to use the Jason Flat Act right now for students? Uh, is this piece of legislation required for you to be able to access funds and or, um, and or uh, anything else that may come along with the Jason Flat Act? Is this piece of legislation required for you to access that for students? Go ahead, I Daniel. I don't believe so. No, I don't believe so. Thank you. Any other questions for Daniel? Yes, go ahead, Representative Perino. Thank you, Chairman Northrup. Uh, Mr. Kosobone, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that you were here at the genesis of this bill, helping to create it and that stuff. In your testimony, you targeted grade or grade six through 12, but the language in the bill says age appropriate. Do you think it would be better to clarify that so we define where we want it in the middle school and high school and not in the elementary school? Yes, sir. I, the reason we did not include the elementary schools is because when you go to the literature, there really aren't too many evidence-based programs that have been researched to show to work with that age group. And the reason that is, I suspect, um, is that even though occasionally um, elementary schools might deal with a student who is suicidal, it, it's, it's, it's fairly rare occurrence. And so that's, so yes, I, I think saying six through 12 might help, but that at the same time, there's nothing stopping an elementary school from providing training to their student body if they feel necessary. Are you good, Representative Pete in? And your question? Must have. Yes. Very good. Any other questions for Daniel? Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I mean, I can't help but notice the similarities and the parallels of your arguments and those that a lot of us have made in trying to advance school safety legislation. We're talking about lives of kids. We're talking about prevention. Um, and then, you know, we've, we've run those efforts really hard and I'm seeing Representative Brown and I, we've had these conversations. I'm just kind of struggling to understand how we, or where maybe your district, what kind of position you took on that particular bill, those particular bills. And then this, I just feel like they're very, very similar. And at the end of the day, I, I think this is about saving kids' lives, but the question is, you know, are all districts doing it? And these are the questions we'll be asked if we advance this, um, which districts aren't. Um, what are the holes? What are the deficiencies? And, you know, why mandate this? And, uh, you know, just if you could kind of tease it out, but every argument you're making, it, it seems like the same one that we've tried to discuss in talking about school safety in general and um, have come up short a few times. Go ahead, Daniel. I'm, I'm sorry, can you, can you restate that question? I'm not, I'm not entirely clear on what you're asking. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, does this need to be mandatory? Shall we change the permissive language to mandatory language? And then do you have information about um, uh, how many districts or how many schools have kind of suicide prevention programs in place? How many don't? And then we, you know, even on the school safety side, ran up against this discussion of cost and that killed us every time. This is gonna be so expensive. We can't afford this. The plate is full in the school day. Those are the kind of criticisms we'll see. So I'm just curious how you would respond to some of that. Go ahead, Daniel. Can you respond sure. to that? Sure. I, I think um, it's my forever that it would be required. The reason being is that we already exist under the state that school districts may do this. And that's a really great question. Which ones are? Because at our current level, we are producing the statistics that we are currently getting and have been getting for over a decade. When you look at 
implementation science and study out how things change, there has to be some sort of accountability. Otherwise, human beings, agencies, um, entities have a very strong propensity to return to baseline. So if we're going to change this, we're gonna to have to do something pretty radical, right? And I think it's worth, and I think we've got a shot. Um, the, the vision for this, this amending this act, it spans over years. We're not just trying to change it for tomorrow, but imagine if we get this done and we compel school districts to do this and we have every single student go through that training over 10 years, we're gonna produce a citizenry that is well-trained and they're gonna take that to their families, their coworkers, to the University of Wyoming, all over the state. And then we'll begin to have an impact hopefully on lowering this, this suicide rate, which we're, we're one of the highest in the nation. So if we don't do something different, we are gonna keep getting the same result, which to me is unac unacceptable. We, we, we can do better. I believe we can do better, but without some sort of requirement, it's highly unlikely that it's going to change. It hasn't changed under the current state that we're in. Thank you, Danielle. I'd like to hear from Superintendent Monteith if she would like to, Peg, if you'd like to comment on the bill. And sure. also, do you know how many districts are actually doing any suicide prevention training at all? Um, thank you, Co-Chair, Senator Cohen, Representative Northrop. I'm Peg Monteith, superintendent in Park 6. I know that all districts are required to do the training, the Jason Flat Act training for their teachers. And I'm assuming that they all do. We certainly do that training every year. As far as the student piece, I think there have been some kind of startup, potentially startup programs. I believe that there was something, um, some sort of an effort in Laramie County to do some training for students, but perhaps don't quote me on that. Uh, we'll check with the superintendent there, Boyd Brown. But um, as far as the student training, as Dan, as Dr. Casaboon stated, we were ready to launch that last spring with our partners at Cody Regional Health and, and um, through the suicide prevention funds. And that just didn't materialize due to COVID. But it's, I would say it's probably my fault that we're here at this point in this district with such a strong, um, strong group of educators and students because this is very personal for me. I lost my son Donnie to suicide um, by firearm almost 10 years ago. And so, um, watching another mother go through what I went through is not, sorry, something that I want to see and I've seen it. And <clears throat> I've worked with moms and dads in this community and it's heartbreaking. Um, I'm sorry. My second year here, um, we lost a student to suicide. He was at the target range with his dad and shot himself in the head. His dad had no idea that Connor was struggling, but Connor's friends all knew. And had those kids had the tools or had known to tell someone, Connor might still be here. We talk about funding and um, we've been blessed in this county that the suicide prevention effort, because our numbers are terrible. We've lost two students to suicide since I've been here, and I swore that wasn't going to happen, but it did. Um, we've been blessed to have community partners that see the need to make something happen in terms of suicide for our youth. We are over double the national rate of death by suicide for students ages 10 through 24, young adults. My son was 27. The urgency for me is to never watch another mom go through what I went through. You, you never get over that. You never get over that. And if we save one life, one life, it would be worth it to me. 
And we cannot do it without getting our kids educated, not just our adults, because kids talk to kids and they need the tools. If you put in may rather than must, we'll probably be the only district that continues to do this, but you've got to have leadership with a passion and that's where mine is. So I'd rather see the bay, the bill fail with a must than go with a may um, without accountability. We're never going to change the We're never going to change the trajectory of, of our continuing to hop between one, two and three for our suicide rate, Wyoming and Montana seem to juggle being first and second every single year. And it's not okay. Um, too many of our kids have access to guns and they're gonna use them. The majority of suicide attempts are made by young men and they are successful because they use guns. Our girls may attempt more often, but they use drugs. So they don't, they, they're not as successful. So my appeal to the committee is from a very personal level, as well as that of an educator. I've talked to students at the high school who have said, I've had kids come to me and they talk about suicide and I don't know what to say to them. I don't know what to do. I don't know who to go to. We've got to give our kids tools. We've got to give our kids tools. They're the ones that are going to make a difference here. Um, I, Sorry, that was a little emotional, but I stand for questions. Questions for Superintendent Monteith. Go ahead, Senator Hutchins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Superintendent, um, I hope you guys can hear me. Is this better, Senator Rafis? Thank you. Um, I don't mean to sound cold, but I want to address the facts that we live in a culture of death. We have abortions. We are asking for uh, physician assisted suicides. Children are seeing things on TV. They're hearing their um, uh, heroes committing suicide and getting all types of attention. You have these video games. And what I see is we want a small portion of our school system to say, don't do this. But when you leave school and you're spending all the time in these other areas, all you're seeing is the culture of death. We have a school system now that has taken on some of the responsibilities I see that parents should take on. We're teaching them sex, we're feeding them, we're washing their clothes, and now we're going to try to teach them not to kill themselves, but we're not teaching them to read and write and um, um, perform mathematical equations to the proficiency we'd like. For me, I see this, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, totally wrong. Um, the more we seem to wanna teach kids, like he said, the Jason, since the Jason Flat Act, our suicides have increased. We're seeing an increase in the number. So do you think, by increasing the education in the school system, we may indeed see an increase in the number of suicides because we haven't changed our society and how they deal with death. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Peg. Would you like to give us an answer? I can attempt. That was, that, that's a tough, tough one. Um, I understand exactly what you're saying and we, we do tackle some of the societal sorts of things in schools. We're working with kids on um, those soft skills. We may call those soft skills um, just being kind to one another. We seem to be in an age where that's not very common. And so that is a struggle. And I agree with you that um, there are a lot of competing issues when you talk about educating, uh, educating students. And certainly all of those come into play. I think it's very, what I see and, and research would support is that when kids are not in a good place, socially, emotionally, healthy, emotionally, it's very difficult for them to make progress academically. Those two absolutely go hand in hand. And that's been one of our, uh, that's been a lot of our work here in Park 6 with our multi-tiered system of supports in 
looking at the response to intervention for both the academic side and, and the social emotional behavioral side of things. You can't have one without the other. To answer your question, um, it's that's a difficult one. We can't fix it all. And I think it takes a village. And we've been lucky here in Park County to have that village, the, the community really supporting what we're trying to do. Does that happen all across the state? I, I can't answer that, but your point is well taken. Very good. Thank you, Senator. Or I'm sorry, Representative. Um, there we go. Got you promoted. Superintendent Monte, thank you. We're going to move on to Ann Perkins. Oh, Senator Coe, Chairman Coe, go ahead. Well, Mr. Chairman, I wasn't going to get in this debate, but, uh, you know, this is an interesting society we find ourselves in. And it's a society made up of families that live in small homes with uh, two parents that sometimes work two and three jobs. Um, it's just a different society. We're the stewards of that society. We're the stewards that look after rearing our young people. That's our responsibility as a community and as parents. So I think that we need to put all the tools in the toolbox that we can. One of the bills that uh, we all worked on, I think most of us worked on was the Safe to Tell program. And I can tell you, I think that's, that's, that's been very effective, but guess what, it, guess what it's number one affecting us has been? Little Johnny, I heard him talking about suicide. And then if we put this in place, it puts another tool in the toolbox to be able to deal with these issues and they're real and all the video stuff and all the social media stuff you see out there. Sure. It's there, but gosh, I just, uh, I believe strongly in this bill, uh, as a compliment to all the other stuff we're doing, uh, safe to tell whatever it might be. And so I would urge the committee to pass this bill. We can debate may or must, um, that's up for debate, but really involved in safe to tell. And I can tell you, it's been effective. We, we know we have saved lives with safe to tell. So that's my response, Mr. Chairman and Peg Monty. Good to see you this morning. It's nice to see you too, Senator. Thank you. Well, Senator, Mr. Chairman, you're absolutely right. Safe to tell is a great program, and I think that we need to just dovetail this right in with it. Um, Senator Ellis, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two. The first is um, I'm in Cheyenne, and I've heard that, you know, we obviously have instances of suicide, and I think there's kind of two schools of thought. One that is let's engage all the students who are affected, and then others and the other school of thought is let's not talk about it because that only encourages more of that behavior. And so if you could talk to me about how your school responds and kind of which school of thought you think um, is most effective in deterring, and uh, or if you share that concern um, that talking about suicide encourages or plants the seed for other students to maybe consider it. Because that is one thing I've heard um, as being a barrier for some school districts and having more robust suicide prevention programs. Go ahead, Superintendent Monte. Um, Chair Northrup, thank you for that question, Senator Ellis. I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. When a when a person takes their own life uh, by suicide, it's like a bomb going off in a marketplace, and there's shrapnel everywhere, and it impacts so many, so many lives, and it is a risk factor for survivors of suicide um, to be more likely to take their own lives. So it is a frightening thing. And in the instances when we've had a, a suicide or a, a death of a student for by any means in our district, we have a crisis team that meets immediately. And we put together a list of kids that are most likely to be at risk. And those students are gathered up by their guidance counselors in the schools. Um, we, we contact parents and we wrap our, not literally, but wrap our arms around those kids to make sure that 
they're okay, that they're safe. Um, we have been able to uh, utilize guidance counselors from our neighboring Park One. They've sent guidance counselors over to help us with those efforts as well as through our Yellowstone Behavioral Health. So we, it's all hands on deck when something like that happens to prevent exactly what you're talking about because it truly is, it does put kids at risk. Talking about it and, and not also giving kids solutions can give can set them on the on the wrong path I think um, you may be talking about um, these suicides that are like a, um, one one two and three they have a pact or something on that order and and it is real and we do have to be careful how we talk to kids but I think being very very open with them very transparent about the language to use with their friends and giving them those tools is helpful. It certainly has been helpful with our adults. I hope I just answered your question. I don't know. I rambled, sorry. No, that's that's fine. Mr. Chairman, one more question. Go ahead. I believe um, a couple of years ago, the legislature passed a May type of uh, bill that says um, that school districts may provide training for students who are victims of sexual abuse from their parents or close family members, because we heard a ton of testimony that a lot of times, um, you know, those poor students receive information that if they tell it's going to ruin their lives, they're going to put their parents and people they love in jail. And so they're, they're scared to report and they don't report. So we put some permissive language in our statutes that say school districts, how about you look at people who can provide some training for these kids um, to my knowledge, no school district has taken that up to your point about our private prior points about if you don't make it required, districts won't do it. Has your district looked at that bill or has have even had the conversation or vote up or down of your school board of whether or not to provide that training? Chairman Northrup, um, yeah, Senator you. Ellis, Senator Ellis, we have not done training specific to sexual abuse. What we've done is trauma informed training for our staff and um, which includes sexual abuse and how to um, work with students who've been through the most traumatic thing they can deal with. And so that we've come at it from, from the trauma side and provided training for our guidance counselors and, and our teachers around what trauma does to kids' ability to learn, their, um, their social emotional health. And so we, we have come at it from that direction. I am not certain that, you know, I think it's been kind of a, a push to do that trauma-informed piece, but I don't know how many school districts are doing that. That's another piece that we've been very, very concerned about and have brought in training for our teachers to ensure that they understand what it does to kids when they've been through that kind of trauma. Thank you, Peg. We're gonna move on to Ann Perkins. Ann? Oh, we have, well, Representative Oprah Mueller has his first question. So I guess we'll hear what Jerry has to say. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Superintendent, there is a wide swath of legislators who believe that the school system is out of its lane in this area and that this problem belongs to uh, families and churches. Could you just wrap up with discussing whose responsibility this is and your view on that, please? Thank you. Go ahead, Peggy. Chair Northrup, uh, Representative Obermuller, I understand that. And I, I wish that schools could draw that line in the sand and say, this is not our issue. This belongs to the families and communities. But unfortunately, it creeps into the schools regardless of, of how, we, um, how we would like to manage that. And kids are kids. They bring it all with them. They can't set those things aside at the door, so we just deal with them. And I think you're going to, you've seen probably schools morph over the years to pick up more and more and more of those issues. And we would wish and pray that our families would take that on and, and do the right things with their kids. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen, and we get the kids we get, and we're dealing with what they bring through the schoolhouse door. Thank you. Thank you, Peg. Really appreciate your input.
You're most Ann, welcome. Thank you. Ann Perkins, it's yours right now. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, Good morning. My name is Ann Perkins, and I wear three hats in this conversation today. My first, I am the Community Prevention Specialist for Sheridan County. So I'm here to educate you on questions you have regarding our suicide prevention monies and funding and what we have and what we're doing with those. I'm also a school board member for District 2 and have been for the last nine years and as a parent then as well whose kids have gone through District 2. When Daniel first approached me on this issue and um, I, I kind of was like, well, why do we need this? Similar to some of you have had that question, why do we need this legislation? Until I realized that there are many districts out in this state, the state with, that is now the third highest in suicide rates, that do not teach suicide education, that do not give our kids those tools, like someone said, in their toolbox to, to be able to deal with this. Um, Senator Hutchins I, and um, Representative Obermuller, um, I love your question, I, and I too think it would be wonderful to separate, you know, what our families can teach us, what our family should teach us versus the schools. But the reality is these skills that we give our children then, they go home to those families and use those skills in their families. In District 2, we actually teach QPR, which is a gatekeeper training that teaches students what to look for um, in our ninth grade health class. So all freshmen get that um, training. And again, I thought that was across the state, so I was really surprised. So my question too would be how many districts are not teaching suicide prevention training? We also have, um, as a county initiative for my prevention specialist um, position, we have Sources of Strength, which is an evidence-based program. It has been in District 2 at the high school for about the past seven years. And we put that in about seven years ago after we had tragically, um, multiple suicide attempts and completions in one year. And we as a school board and an administration knew we needed to do something different. That program has made an amazing change. That along with the QPR, which again, they're two different programs. Um, you know, one teaches the signs, the other one is way upstream. Sources of Strength is an evidence-based strength program that teaches us how, how gives kids the skills to deal with before they ever get in that crisis. So again, we're giving them those resources. Um, as a prevention specialist then in the last two years, we have put that uh, program in Sheridan Junior High School, in Tongue River High School. And in um, this year, we are putting in it in Bighorn, um, both their middle school and their high school. And then as well, um, Sources of Strength does have an elementary, a three through six curriculum. And so it will be going in Tongue River in grades three through six. And in Sheridan, there is a, one of the elementary schools is piloting that. So I am really excited and I would love to speak with any of you offline um, if you have more questions about this. One thing that um, Senator Hutchinson mentioned that I want to address is that um, the, the culture that we live in and programs such as QPR or especially a Sources of Strength program it really is a shift in mind. It is a shift in language that you use. It is a hope, help, and strength instead of a shock and awe. And so that you're incorporating this into your student body, into your teachers, and you are changing that culture. And that's really what we do. Hello. Uh, which is pretty amazing. As to the question of local control, I know that's important to all of us. Again, every county has um, prevention dollars, suicide prevention dollars that you have provided. Um, we all have different work plans and have different you know, ways we are allocating that suicide prevention money. But it, this is again, a great opportunity for our prevention specialists in each county to work with our districts in each county and find out what is the best fit, what can they do and how can they work together. I really think that was your intent when you gave us those suicide prevention dollars that we work with our school districts. Questions, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Ann. Questions for Ann? Go ahead, Senator Landon. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and Ms. Perkins, very well done this morning. Appreciate 
uh, all of the information you've shared. My question is, what are the cost drivers to this program? We've had testimony this morning that uh, we're following the Jason Flat Act and we're, we're doing what we need to do with our faculty and staff, but uh, not the student module. So, and then I, I keep hearing about budget and of course we're all concerned on that front. So what, what would drive any further cost with the programs that are already being offered? Go ahead, Ann. Senator Landon, that's a great question. So in 2018, um, so, uh, District 2, we did train, and, and that was at district cost, all of our um, psychologists and counselors in QPR. That was about $500 per person. Now that those people are all trained, and myself, I took that training as well, I'm able to offer that course free to anyone in the county, and I offer it to community members. I've done it for hundreds of people within the community, work with Northern Wyoming Mental Health, trained all their staff on that. So once you get those investments of you know, those people in your community, it can be really reasonable. Um, again, there's different programs. There's ASSIST, which is a two-day suicide. That's for more for older adults. But again, um, there, are, there are trainers within our state that can provide these resources. Sources of Strength, which is that evidence-based program, is a little more expensive. Knowing what I knew about Sources of Strength, that was really important to me as a prevention specialist to focus on that. And so I actually have it as a countywide initiative. And I put that in my work plan as a budget item. And that's I am spending the majority of my suicide prevention dollars funding those schools so they are able to put that program. Again, it's a peer-led program because like some of you said, our, our students know before us, before the adults, where that goes. And Senator Coe's comment about um, Safe to Tell, again, this is that other tool. I use source, uh, Safe to Tell and have used it for the past two years in Sheridan County. So this is again, just complementing what we already have. Further questions, go ahead, Senator Landon. Just a quick follow-up, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and Ms. Perkins, Thank you for uh, alluding to the, to the CPR uh, efforts, the life-saving uh, cl classes that you're providing. Uh, that's another one of the efforts on the part of the Joint Education Committee. About five years ago, they will remember that I brought a bill which would have made it statewide uh, that we would teach our young people how to save lives and uh, ran into the same brick wall that's been alluded to by Senator Ellis and Representative Brown uh, with regard to safety measures. And, and it all usually boils down to um, a viewpoint that the state should not ever be telling the districts what to do out there. Um, so just to, just to comment, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's what we're up against. And we'll have the debate a little bit later about in our hearts, we probably know that, that we should make it mandatory. This is something that's very important, but can we take it into the chamber? We need to take Ms. Perkins with us. She's much more eloquent than many of us, that's for sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, can I respond to that? Certainly, go ahead, Ann. Thank you, Mr. Landa, that was very nice. And I wanted to combine um, Senator Ellis's question about this, is that that idea that, yes, should we, should we be legislating this? Again, um, like Daniel said, this is a problem that's already here. I mean, you can say, oh, I don't think we should. It is here. And when it happens in our schools, it devastates that school culture and that not just the school, but the community as well. Senator Ellis asked if, you know, if we teach suicide prevention, if we teach children the signs of suicide, does it put it in their heads? Well, I can tell you the research tells us that it is already there. These kids know about it. They are seeing it in culture. They are seeing it from public figures and they are thinking about it. Um, if you know the PNA, which is the prevention needs a special or prevention needs analysis, which um, you know every two years we survey our students. If you look at 10th and 12th graders in statewide, in 2018, almost 20 percent of our students, 10th and 12th graders across the state, said they have considered suicide. So again, it's out there. We don't really need to hide our heads. 
we need to really know, address it. Research again shows that once you address it, you are bringing that stigma, you're taking that stigma away and you are bringing it out in the open for people to have conversations about, for people to think, oh, wow, I'm not the only one who's feeling down. For people to think, okay, I, I realize it's okay not to be okay. And now I have the tools to ask for help. Very good, thank you, Ann. All right, I'd like to move on to who we got, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanna be clear um, that I don't be in, I'm not in that school of thought that we should just, someone commit suicide and then we just better not talk about it because it's gonna influence other kids to do it. I think that that's more harmful than trying to tackle it head on. So when I said that there's a school of thought, yeah. I've heard people argue that. I just wanna be clear that that's not my argument at all. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hutchins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree with uh, Senator Ellis. My questions were not uh, meant to uh, say I'm for or against um, speaking about suicide, but uh, this is to uh, Mrs. Perkins. Quick question, uh, with all the research, all the data you have, what are the top three reasons students six through 12, uh, K th or what, sixth grade through 12th grade want to commit suicide and are you addressing those top three issues um, when you see them? Thank you. And do you have an answer for that? Mr. Chairman, Senator Hutchins, um, I don't, I can't give you the top three reasons right off the bat. I could get that information for you. I will say that one of them is that um, feeling comfortable, feeling um, accepted. And that piece again then comes from different programs, sources of strength works um, and teaches peers again, how to deal with their peers and including others in those. So a lot of times, you know, it is um, that feeling of disillusionment, that feeling of not fitting in, but I can get that information for you um, more specifically if you'd like Senator Hutchins. And thank you very much. And I know none of you, are, you know, are probably of that school of thought that, but I really think it's important that we talk about it. And I really do get passionate about this conversation. Thank you, Ann. I think you're doing a great job. And, and yes, we're passionate about it too, because that's why we're on education. So thank let's you. Move on. Let's move on to Hannah. Hannah, do you are you receiving us? Are you are you there? Hello? There you go. You're still muted. Can you unmute, please? Yes, hello. And keep your comments brief, please. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Hannah Blasco. I am a senior at Cody High School. Um, I'm here today because I am testifying for personal reasons on behalf of my brother. Um, his name might not mean much to the board, but it means a lot to me, and his name is Drew Blasco. Um, he killed himself by jumping off the Buffalo Bill Dam on May 5th of 2018, and I feel as though if something like the Jason Flat Act had been in place when he was alive, then his life may have been saved. And I also feel like to reject this bill would be a gross miscarriage of justice for the children who have become statistics in Wyoming. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Any questions for Hannah? None appearing, we're gonna move on to Sophie. Sophie Anderson, are you there? Hello, yes. <laughs> Please go ahead. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Sophie Anderson. Um, I'm a senior at Cody High School, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Youth for Justice, Teen Leadership Coalition, Gay Straight Alliance, and I'm also the president of our National Honor Society here. Um, I'm here to ask for your support amending the Jason Flat Act. Youth for Justice was actually key in getting the original law passed. So we are especially supportive of this amendment um, because giving students training would make it much, much more effective. Um, students are the basis of everything in the community. Um, if the students know what to do, then that's just gonna build up from there. Um, suicide isn't something that students see and then um, that they get that idea in their head. It's something that's rooted inside of them. 
and um, addressing this is um, giving them recognition for their feelings and letting them know that they are seen and that they can be helped. Um, I have personal experience with this. Um, my half sister, um, Nicole Anderson, committed suicide by firearm um, a year and a half ago. And I would have appreciated um, having training, sorry, <laughs> and being able to um, see the signs when they were happening because maybe the outcome could have been different. Um, so <laughs> I'm personally asking for you to make training mandatory for all students in Wyoming. Thank you. Good job, Sophie, thank you. Questions for Sophie? All right, we're gonna move on to Paula. Oh wait, Senator Hutchins has a question, go ahead. Really quick, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Sophie, thank you for your uh, testimony. Have you students thought about, especially the Cody uh, Youth for Justice, uh, forming a little group, an alliance together, a coalition where you guys can work with a community that seems to want to work so um, hard with you guys to uh, get the funds needed to help yourselves instead of coming to the legislature? Just a thought. Um, thank you, Senator Hutchings, for the question. Um, Personally, I think that this comes from a stance that um, I understand that it's there are things that maybe we would like to have be dealt with at home or in other places in the community and not have the school take them over. But personally, yes, have us um, do that. Um, I just I personally feel like um, the school setting an ex example that they understand that um, they personally understand where these kids are coming from and how they feel that they're addressing these feelings. So it's not just students who care about other students, but it's in general, the entire school district that are addressing these feelings. Um, because not all, I mean, as much as we'd like for all students to be connected, they're not. Um, everyone comes from different places and different groups. And um, personally, I would love to be a part of something that would um, push <laughs> awareness of this. But I think that it needs to come from people that everyone can consider to be a leader, that everyone looks to as a um, someone, <laughs> as an adult. Um, I think that it needs to be rooted from the education system personally, um, because it's a really serious topic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. No further questions for Sophie. We're going to move on to Paula. Mr. Chairman. Oh, go ahead, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Sophie may have vanished. Sophie, are you still there? Well, I'll ask the question. Hopefully, she'll rejoin us to answer the question. There she is. Hello. Sorry, I was thought I was supposed to leave, but I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Um, Sophie, first of all, I I appreciate your comments. I appreciate your testimony, and we are your representatives. So we we are here to serve you and and give you an educational system that you want. So I, I appreciate you you bringing your concerns and your feedback and your life experience to us. And um, the question I have for you is with regard to the efficacy of, of a program. And, and we're looking at maze and we're looking at shells and we're looking at doing it yourself or doing it through the school. So my question for you, as somebody who, who lives this experience in, in, in high school, in the system, what is going to be the most effective way for us to carry out your interests? Is, is that going to be uh, a required educational program in your view through all high schools in the state? Or is that going to be a, an allowance of, of these types of, of programs? And um, we, I wanna make sure that we're, we're doing our best to represent your interests and in carrying it out in a way that you feel would be most effective. So what are your thoughts on how we can make it the most effective it possibly could be? Go ahead, Sophie. Um, thank you, Senator Rothfuss for your question. Um, personally, I think that changing the wording of the, the current standing act to um, must instead of may is something that's really um, important to um, creating a kind of a environment where suicide is not um, 
stigmatized, but actually addressed. Um, if not, I mean, obviously not all school districts are creating um, this training for students because otherwise I think that we would see um, a drop in our numbers. Um, but I personally believe that um, just letting like letting students know that we understand how huge of an issue this is and like a lot of people feel this way and it's not your fault that you feel that way like it's just it's something that comes from inside of you and um addressing that I think is really important and letting them know that they have students surrounding them that understand this feeling as well is really important um to them feeling seen and recognized because a lot of times um, students go to this dark place because they feel like they don't have anyone. At least I know um, my half sister, she felt really alone. She felt like she didn't have anyone, which obviously wasn't the case, but um, it's it was it's something in my household that wasn't and still isn't um, addressed. It's not something that we talk about. And I think that's a really um, important environment to create, especially in a school system, because all all kids are in a school system together. So it's because you can't just depend on a household to provide this kind of information. I personally don't go to church, so I wouldn't be able to get that information from there. I think that that's why it's deeply rooted and most important that it comes from the people that we look up to for education, because those are some of the most important people in our lives. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. All right, for the questions for Sophie. Okay, so we're gonna go to Paula. Paula, it's your chance, to finally. Go ahead. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Paula Medina. I'm a junior at Cody High School and I'm the secretary of the student body. And I've come here to speak and be on behalf of and represent student council, um, FBLA, Model UN and the Robotics Club. Um, apart from all of these clubs showing support for the amendment of the Jason Flat Act, um, I'd like to speak from personal experience. Uh, three of my closest friends have attempted suicide and have talked to me about it. And I've plenty of times I've had to talk them out of committing. And it's a very nerve wracking process knowing that if you say the wrong stuff, then you may never be able to see them again. I wouldn't wish it upon anyone to just sit there unsure on the best way to address it. I wasn't ever provided with the tools to fully talk to anyone or to do anything more than just talk to them and try to just convince them to not do it. So for me, making it required for all students six to 12 would, is really important because I don't want anyone to ever just have to blindly go into it and hope that you say the right thing and that your friends don't commit suicide. Thank you. Questions for Paula? All right, I see none. So we're gonna move on to Lorraine Step. Thank you, Paula. Good morning and thank you. I'm Lorraine Steppe, I'm in Cody, Wyoming. I'm a counselor in private practice. I'm also the president of the National Association of Social Workers, Wyoming um, chapter. I represent over 300 uh, social workers across the state. And as well, I'm one of the lead people at our local uh, suicide prevention team that also addresses mental health. So I'm in Cody. I've been listening to all of the things that are going on. Um, I'm a trainer for QPR. I've been trained to um, help physicians recognize and respond to suicide risk in primary care. And I also teach um, mental health providers um, how to recognize and respond to suicide risk. Um, part of why my voice is really important here is I work with people on a weekly basis who have suicidal ideation and talking about suicide does not decrease the risk. I've had people who said, I've been suicidal for 20 years and nobody's ever asked me the question that way. And then being able to respond um, to help them without sending them to a hospital or to um, an inpatient facility. Um, I, I know them the best, so it's best to keep them in the community. Um, in working over all of these years, 
what I see most often with suicide, and I also have a support group for our community for who are survivors of suicide loss, is there was a lot of signs oftentimes that people were going to die by suicide. And their teenage cohort, they knew, the young people around them knew what was going on. And so by teaching these young people about suicide and showing them what to do, it decreases our rate. And why this is important to NASW Wyoming is we are number one in the nation for youth suicide. And our efforts on what we're doing are not working. We've got to do something different to help these young people. So if you have any questions for me, I don't want to repeat everything everyone else has said in the interest of time, but um, I'm here to, with what I know, to answer questions or to, um, you know, just lend my support to this important effort. Questions for Lorraine? Thank you, Lorraine. We're going to move on to Dr. Hackman. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, Dr. Hollis Hackman with the Wyoming Psychological Association. I'll be brief. Uh, my organization rises in support of, of this proposed legislation. We, we certainly um, support the requirement that, that this occur in, in all school districts and that um, the interventions that are used are evidence-based. In other words, uh, have a proven track record of having a positive impact on on this problem in our state. As many people have said, we we have one of the highest rates of suicide in the country, and it, it's been that way. We've been in the top five for well over a decade, for a long time. So anything we can do to help reduce that rate is going to be helpful. I would just I would just um, comment. Um, there was some discussion about is talking about suicide going to increase the risk that, that people are going to get it in their heads and such. And I would just point out that um, a, a, a seminal book was written 10 years ago by Thomas Joyner called Myths of Suicide. And one of the myths is, is that if you talk about it, then it, it plants that idea in somebody's head. In fact, the opposite is true. Talk actually saves lives. And when, when people who are thinking about suicide have an opportunity to talk about it, they feel less isolated um, and, and it, it's, there's a better outcome as a result. So anything that we can do to reduce the stigma related to mental disorders, in particular suicidal kinds of um, thoughts um, it, is gonna be beneficial to our community at large. So uh, with that, I would, I would stand for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Question from Senator Ellis. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Senator Hutchins. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, doctor, quick question. When you talk about evidence-based um, assistance with these issues, uh, what role does uh, religion play in your evidence-based um, research? Go ahead, um, doctor. Mr. Chairman, Senator Hutchings, good question. Um, the evidence that I'm familiar with as relates to school interventions includes primarily of the Sources of Strength program. Other programs have also been looked at, but we implemented that program shared in two when I was a trustee along with, um, along with Ann Perkins. Um, in that particular study, they used a Sources of Strength uh, protocol and implemented it in a, a large number of um, high schools and middle schools in the country and they compared the results of that um, intervention to um, a waitlist control, if you will. So there was there was a comparison of this particular protocol with um, with schools where it hadn't been implemented, and, and then they compared the results. And so, role of religion wasn't included in that particular protocol, but the results did show that um, students that were trained in this technique were four times more likely than um, peers that weren't trained in the technique to, to report out to a trusted adult um, that they knew about uh, a student who was at risk. And then there's an intervention that's possible as a result of that. So when we talk about evidence-based, we, we're, we're talking about uh, randomly assigning treatments um, to uh, different groups and then having one group not get the treatment until later or have it have it be separated from the group that's that's getting the treatment and then you compare the results 
later. I'm, I'm oversimplifying all this, but, but to your question, we, it, the religious piece wasn't specifically included in, in the protocol used for sources of strength. Okay. I hope okay. that answers the question. Yes. yes. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Hollis. Anybody else got a question for the good doctor? Thank you, sir. We'll move on to Brian Farmer. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Brian Farmer with Wyoming School Boards Association. Uh, if I could take just a very brief moment, Mr. Uh, Co-Chairman, I'd, I'd like to say uh, a thank you to yourself, uh, to Chairman Co. Uh, Chairman, uh, both of you have been such great leaders for education in our state and, and really appreciate your work, your integrity. Um, the dedication that you have given to education. So thank you to the two of you for everything that you have done. Uh, also a, a quick thank you to representatives Piperinen and Freeman um, who have not only dedicated a legislative service to education, but careers uh, to education as well. So uh, the four of you will certainly be missed uh, in the legislature and, and just wanted to say very quickly, Thank you for everything you've done for the children of Wyoming uh, and for education in our state. Uh, Mr. Chairman, specifically um, on, on this matter, uh, I, I just wanted to point out um, something that's actually not in front of you. Um, so, sometimes the best solutions um, are uh, outside of legislative solutions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, some, sometimes I think districts focus their uh, resources on that educational basket of goods. Uh, and so it may be that the best, uh, the, the best way to address this is not necessarily through legislation, but through the health standards. Um, that's certainly um, similar to the education or to the argument related to CPR. Um, I'm looking here and it says that the Wyoming Department of Education put out a call for participants uh, and 10 addi additional members were just recently added to the Health, uh, health Standards Review Committee um, and they've met twice to date. Um, the uh, current, the last revisions to the health standards were made in 2012 um, and I think uh, that this group will continue to meet. And, and Mr. Chairman, it may be that the best way to address suicide awareness um, and suicide prevention is, is not a program. Um, that may be another tool in the toolbox and, and uh, that, that's good, but it may be that the best way to address this is through health standards um, to make sure that we have strong uh, health standards that will then drive the curriculum in our school districts. I know presently some school districts use the program uh, that Senator, uh, or I'm sorry, that uh, um, Trustee Perkins um, mentioned, Ann Perkins, uh, trustee in Sheridan County School District Number Two. That QPR program is used in a number of districts um, as a prevention program. Um, Safe to Tell is is another resource that's being used. So maybe instead of uh, adding on a, another uh, program, maybe the strongest and best thing we can do as a state is make sure that we have some really strong, solid health standards to drive and inform curriculum uh, in our districts. Uh, and certainly would support that suicide awareness uh, is something that needs to be addressed uh, and, and needs to be uh, uh, something that we are spending our time and our resources on. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, just wanted to bring up uh, that there is another way. Uh, there is something else that we could be doing uh, along this realm and just wanted to offer those thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Brian. Senator Rothfuss has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Brian. I'm curious, you know, we obviously run through the process of uh, developing statewide standards. Uh, we've got our, our nine-year cycle. Um, Clearly in the past, this hasn't risen to a core component of the curriculum that we've offered and been integrated. Uh, so my question would be, if we, if we want to accomplish the objective by the means you're discussing, how would we go about doing that uh, to actually effectuate the change? And, and you know, maybe it's a matter of modification to this to ensure that it can go through our our health curriculum and, and into the standards, but what are your thoughts on, on how we can effectuate that approach? Mr. Chairman, 
Mr. Chairman, that uh, Health Standards Review Committee is presently meeting. Um, it is their plan. Uh, my understanding is to bring uh, revised standards to the State Board of Education in the spring of 2021. Um, it's my understanding that they will be meeting uh, additional times in the month of January. So I think a letter from uh, this committee um, to that Health Standards Review uh, Committee encouraging them to examine um, the components related to suicide awareness in the health standards um, would encourage and inform their discussions. Uh, certainly, um, that's something that we hope to, uh, to uh, push through that process as well. Um, to help strengthen those health standards. Um, it just so happens that as they're under review right now, this is a great time to have that discussion. Um, let's go to Representative Connolly first. Go ahead. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. And actually it's a follow up to Senator Rothfuss. Mr. Farmer, do you see it being an either or? I mean, it seems to me that if we pass this bill, and in particular with changing the first May on page one, line 10 to a, a shall, it would obligate that the standards then address suicide prevention, assuring them that it will happen. Go ahead, Brian. Mr. Chairman. Representative Conley, I think sometimes um, it's a matter of how things are regarded. Um, Jason Flat Act. Um, originated, I believe, in the state of Tennessee around 2008, and it was intended um, at its design to be a training program for staff. Um, certainly, um, it's been expanded in other ways in other states, um, but a training program is two hours of, uh, of uh, training time in Tennessee when it started. Um, of course, Wyoming has a additional uh, requirement um, but I think, you know, is, is curriculum more than a program? Um, programs are oftentimes seen as add-ons where um, the standards are seen as driving the curriculum. Um, I don't know that it's an either or. Um, that certainly is the prerogative of the legislature. Uh, I, I would just say that uh, in, in my past work with a um, state board of education task force around the basket of goods, that group had a discussion about, hey, when these ideas are brought up about let's uh, add CPR, uh, let's add financial literacy, let's add whatever, what's the best way to push that forward? And it was the recommendation of that task force um, that they um, be directed through the standards adoption process, that that's the best way um, to get things integrated into a curriculum uh, and real attention to be brought into classrooms. So uh, I, I can tell you that was uh, the recommendation of that task force. Um, I was a, a member of that group, um, certainly can't speak beyond uh, that because that was all that they, they said on that matter. Okay, Senator Landon was next. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Mr. Farmer, thank you. I, as usual, you, you've hit some really great points. My only caution would be that uh, having brought the legislation that we've referred to a couple of times, uh, the, uh, the life-saving CPR training, um, you know, we're five years in the making at this point. Uh, regarding suicide uh, awareness, the timing is better because as you mentioned that, you know, we're having meetings right now um, with regard to health standards, but, you know, it, it just seems to me that, uh, that going the other way is, is pretty time consuming and may not even be in place for a couple of years. Any comments about, uh, at least if you pass legislation like this, it's expected immediately, right? Go ahead, Brian. Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Landon, I think um, certainly um, every district will comply with uh, the legislative mandates um, that you, you put forward. Um, so certainly we will follow um, all direction that, that you've put forward. Um, I, I would say that in terms of standards adoption, they are on a nine-year cycle. Um, there is a way to bring forward uh, a review of standards or a partial review of standards before that nine-year cycle comes up. Um, and, and again, I, I simply am suggesting that if you are looking for the best way of integrating something into um, the basket of goods, 
um, into that um, that core focus of the school district, it is probably through the standards process. Um, if you want to add on, um, if you want to make a, a other things additionally um, and perhaps more immediately, then legislative solutions can be a way to do that. Thank you, Brian. Senator Ellis, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanna make sure I understand your position correctly. So you oppose this bill, if we were to change the May to a shall, you would oppose it. Is that correct, Mr. Farmer? Mr. Chairman, uh, okay. my association takes no position on the bill. Just wanted to bring an additional perspective uh, to your attention. Um, uh, the, the challenge for us is we have two kind of guiding principles. Um, one is uh, what I would call um, a, a support for um, school safety and security um, and, and see this falling within that realm. And the other is what I would colloquially call the kind of stay in your lane um, sort of principle. And, and that would be one that would suggest um, following the standard adoptions process, that the best thing um, within our system is to utilize the system that we have rather than tacking things um, onto, the, onto the sides. So using the standards adoption process. We support both of those. If you were to pass this legislation, we would not oppose it. Um, if you move uh, forward with it, um, I don't know that we would necessarily support it either. Um, it, it's, it, it's competing values that, that our members have articulated. Go ahead, Senator oh. Ellis. Just to be clear, I hear that that's opposition. The preference would be legislature stay in your lane. This is local control issue. And if you really want to tackle it, do it through standards, not through an add on program. So I am I'm confused by what you're saying when you say you don't oppose it, but we do oppose it. That's what I hear. Um, I do want to touch on one thing that your association brings up regularly, and that is the plates full. We're our kids, so much is being asked to them. The day is full. Please don't add another thing on there. I've heard that from you time and again. And so I'm, I'm curious to know if that is part of your testimony today or if for some reason that this falls outside of that. And I'm just kind of curious how you determine what, what's appropriate to be on the plate and what's not. Go ahead, Ryan. Mr. Chairman, um, first of all, I would say that we, we do take no position. It is not opposition. I'm simply pointing out competing um, viewpoints from amongst our membership um, as to priorities. Um, the um, stay in the lane is talking about utilizing the processes. It's not local control versus the legislature. Um, it's recognizing that we have a process for adding um, to that platter, adding to that basket and managing that basket. And, and, and that's in that standards adoption process. Uh, so I think the standards are where we identify um, the most important things um, that districts must do, um, what students are expected to know and learn. So if it is a part of the standards adoption process, that becomes the focus of the curriculum in that area of the basket of goods. So if we're talking about what do we do in our health uh, uh, curriculum right now, um, anything that's in the standards is the priority. And, and so um, as you define the priority through the existing processes, um, that's, that's what districts will tackle. Further questions for Brian? Thank you, Brian. We'll move Thank on you, to, I'm gonna slaughter your name, Jill, I wanna say Jillian Freitas. Yes, I'm Jillian Freitas. I'm uh, a student at University of Wyoming. I'm in the psychiatric nurse practitioner um, cohort, but I, I appreciate everyone um, everyone's perspective on this, but I have a little bit of a different perspective in that what we're doing right now is not working. We have one of the highest adolescent um, suicide rates in the nation. And so what we're doing right now isn't working. And I know kids have a lot on their plate, but this would this is something to put on their plate that would help them to cope perhaps. And I believe that the decisions that you make today could save lives. Um, I really believe that we can save some of our kids if we use evidence-based programs. So yes, we have some QPR, we have some, some education happening now, but I think it's imperative that we use the latest and greatest evidence-based programs in our school to help our kids. 
Anybody have questions? Go ahead, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, one thing we haven't heard, I think we asked for at the outset was, does anyone have a command of how many districts have some kind of suicide prevention program in place? And if so, do we have a sense of what those programs are to your point about being evidence-based? And the reason I asked this again, back to school safety and security, that was a question I got all the time. Who's doing it, who's not? The Department of Education did a survey and I can tell you that the quality of safety programs out there varies from districts that revise them annually are really invested to things that are, you know, haven't been looked at and touched for 15 years and were really antiquated. So um, I'd like to know that about suicide prevention. Somebody, we've got to know this going, going forward. We need to know this. Do you know that? I don't know. The oh, sorry. I thought that. You're good. Go ahead. Oh, um, I don't know the numbers right off the top of my head and perhaps you do. I just know that it's spotty at best and that there are some places that are using suicide prevention that's direct student body education versus staff education, but um, it's not nearly, as, it's not, it's spotty. There's just a few places that I know of. Further questions? Thank you, Juliana. All right, anybody else? Karen Vaughn, is there anybody else? Mr. Chairman Northrup, no. We have concluded public comment for this topic. Very good, that will conclude public comment for the topic. Committee, what's your pleasure on the bill? Representative Connolly. Mr. Chairman, move the bill. All right, move the bill, seconded by Freeman and, and Co-Chairman Coe. All right, committee, we'll go through the bill. So Representative Simpson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a little bit of information for Senator Ellis's question. Um, right. Some of you may not have checked your email. Representative Brown forwarded an email to us from um, Campbell County indicating that they are teaching it to the kids. I've checked in with my superintendent here at Lincoln County too and they're teaching it in every school in our district. So there is a couple districts there that we know that has already implemented this and taken the step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. All right, we're gonna go through the bill. We are on LSO 0188. This is suicide prevention. We're on page one. Page one, anybody, go ahead, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move to amend to make the maze shalls, and that would be on page one, line 10. It would be on page one, line 12. And I believe that's the end of the list, <clears throat> but I would uh, provide flexibility for staff to conform. Is there I'll a second? For discussion. All right, we have two seconds. Discussion on the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I'll start. If I Go may. ahead. Thank you. I think from the testimony, it's very clear that we need to make sure that this is part of uh, all of the education in the state of Wyoming. We don't know where this is going to happen and we can't predict beforehand. It's not something where we can say, well, the problem's in Cody because we just heard from Cody students. So we want to make sure they teach it problems everywhere in the state of Wyoming. We, we don't know where it's going to happen next and, and we can't be intermittent or arbitrary about where this type of education is being offered. I do understand all of the concerns about stacking things onto the plate, all of the challenges that we have for making things mandatory and the, and the pushback that we get for doing that. Uh, but if something else has to slide off the plate because we do this right, I'm okay with that. That's really what it comes down to. This is just more important than a lot of the other things that we teach. And if, if we have to have something else suffer a little bit so that we can get this right and prevent deaths and make sure that our students survive, uh, that's more important really than anything else we're doing. So I hope we can be very supportive of this. I also support the approach and, and will bring a motion afterwards to to write a letter and, and try and get this integrated into our, our standards. But uh, this is an appropriate step. I think we need to be strong about it. As we heard from Senator Ellis, uh, we don't get a lot of results out of Mays uh, and, and for good reason, because we have too many shells. 
And if, if school districts are offered a shall and a may, they're going to do the shall because they have to. Uh, this is more important than a lot of the shells that we already have in place, certainly to me, to the students that we heard from today that provided truly exceptional testimony. I'm so proud that we have those students in the state of Wyoming. And when they come forward and they ask us for something, I want to make sure they get it. Senator Ellis, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess this is a question kind of a follow up to maybe Senator Rothfuss, who just makes the point, you know, we've got this bill that treats suicide prevention as another kind of, I guess, add on program is how we've been treat, you know, categorizing these um, types of bills. And just drawing the comparison to Senator Landon's previous efforts to require some CPR training. Um, to his point, that's been years in the making. And so I am struggling with this concept of what is the best way to proceed as a legislature. You know, we had that conversation about providing training to uh, victims of sexual abuse. That was a may. I don't think it went anywhere. You know, should we be requiring that uh, the state board adopt those or write, rewrite curriculum? I'm just kind of structurally trying to get there on what the better approach is. And so um, I guess it's not just for Senator Rothfuss, but if anyone has thoughts on that, um, I think there are pros and cons to both, but it's messy and it's confusing. And I think we, we'd be better served of kind of coming up with a, a way of handling these, the, these kind of bills going forward. So we're not faced with this ongoing, you know, is it a program or is it part of the curriculum should it be part of the standards, How, you know, I'm just curious to know what other committee members think. Senator Landon, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, appreciate both the senators um, hitting right on the issue. I, I'll try not to wander, but I, I keep going back to five years ago when we brought the legislation, supported, I think, almost unanimously by the Joint Education Committee at that point, that uh, especially in an environment like Wyoming, we really should be teaching life skills training and CPR training and uh, all of the activities that, that our people are involved in. Um, what drove that effort was just that every summer, uh, there are at least a couple people we lose at nearby lakes around uh, my community. Uh, at least one uh, could have been saved, but nobody who was there at that moment was able to do it. And so um, great effort, but it's been five years in the making. So I, I'll tell you what compels me today, Mr. Chairman. It was the testimony of those students that Senator Roth was pointed to and one of them said, you know, it's important for the leaders of education to step up and lead us on this. And uh, folks, that, that hit me where it needed to. Um, you know, I, I realize as well as anyone what kind of resistance we might run into. But I think in our hearts, we all know that this is really something that should be done in our in our school districts out there. So um, that's my thoughts. I appreciate uh, Senator Ellis sort of encapsulating sort of the dilemma. But for me, I think it's time for us to lead. And we lead with, with saying, look, this is something that needs to be taking place. So I think I'm going to support the shall and not the may. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I guess I, uh, I hate to hate to be the, uh, you know, the heartless ogre in the in the group here. But what I hear us saying at this point is, um, this is we're okay with doing another unfunded mandate to schools. Um, we 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 did have some amazing students, and I applaud them for coming forward. Um, I, I guess what I'm hearing is, you know, if the students testify, we should pass the law that they're, they're speaking on. And I, I don't know that that's necessarily the truth. Uh, we have very serious and critical issues across the state with many other things uh, beyond just suicide. Um, I ran a budget amendment last year to dump $8 million into suicide prevention in the House of Representatives, and it was defeated. So I'm not sure that we're serious about suicide prevention. Um, one of the biggest questions that I asked at the very onset of public testimony from everybody coming through was whether or not this piece of legislation was actually needed. Um, I, I'm really not a fan of, of running pieces of legislation that make us feel good just to do it. 
um, because it, it gives some some ideas to people that, hey, we might be able to do this. Now we're saying that they have to do this. Okay, that that's a little bit better. But I'm not so certain that they have to have this piece of legislation to use the Jason Flat Act. Now we're mandating that they have to use the Jason Flat Act in order to get this 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 unfunded mandate to the students. Um, I, I do also agree that when when we hear it, it's not very long. I, I'm QPR certified as well. Um, I, I had to do it for my job, um, and and I I think it's a great training. Um, but I'm, it, it takes an hour, hour and a half. If you, if you really push it out there and you're, you're really, really involved with it, you can take it to two hours. It's really not that much to ask for, but it's unfunded. Um, other school districts are already doing this. Uh, and I heard one of the good senators say, we're okay with something falling off the plate. So we make sure we do this. I, I would be in favor of cutting something else off the plate. Um, let, let's hear what we can take off the plate before we add something else on there. And I, the one that comes to mind that I've, I've seen multiple times that we passed a couple of years ago was financial literacy. Uh, do we want to take, um, do we want to take financial literacy off the plate so we can do, uh, you know, suicide prevention? And so I, I guess I, I, I understand that we have a very serious issue at hand here. I, I really do. Um, I'm just very, very concerned that we are stacking on in a time of already fumbling uh, financial crisis. We are asking these school districts to do even more um, with less. And, and I'm just not sure that this is the right time to be doing that. So um, I, I will be against the shall and, and most likely against the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Connolly. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On and in favor of the amendment, you know, I served on this committee, I think with both good co-chairs a decade ago when we debated and passed the Safe to Tell program. And as the good co-chairman talked about, we had long, vigorous debates about whether it should be permissive or mandatory, whether or not we would fund it, how we would do it. Shouldn't we just leave it to the districts in order to decide to go down this road? And we decided to step up as a state. And we have found, as the good co-chairman said, it has been incredibly effective. But there's another step that we need to make. And we've heard over and over again today that it is that we need to bolster the Jason Flat Act. It's just not enough to train educators, but we need to give the tools to the students to be able to respond. I mean, that's the whole. I mean, it was the expectation that students would talk to adults. The whole is that students don't necessarily talk to adults before they talk to each other. I don't see it as an unfunded mandate. It, right in the bill, it says that it would just be part of instruction in a health and safety program. It's not like it's being made out of whole cloth. We already have that program there. We're just mandating it be part of that health and safety program. Those students told us what they needed in order to prevent the death of the loved ones in their family. They wish they had those skills and they didn't have it. We could simply provide it. We've heard about other programs, CPR, suicide, um, child sexual assault that haven't gone further. I say to those who have brought those bills in the past and they haven't gone farther, all right, bring them back again. We're finding that perhaps this is the mechanism that we need to do. This is it. Having maze isn't working in terms of education about child sexual assault, right? Going into standards could take nine years, right? That's not the way to do it. Let's do it here and now. We have the opportunity to do it. And I'm in favor of the amendment and the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Freeman was first, then Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have to say that uh, the testimony that we heard today um, caused me to go on an emotional roller coaster based on my experience as a teacher for in the classroom for 33 years. I've been in the classroom when um, we heard that uh, one of our students had committed suicide. And that feeling is uh, uh, undescribable of what you would see with the students that. Uh, react to that and even how I respect reacted to that. I don't know how I'm gonna vote on this amendment. So 
I'll, I'll find out when when the, the vote comes up. Uh, with my experience in the legislature, I think that if we leave the May in there, it increases the, uh, the ability to pass the body. Uh, and and that's okay. Shall will make a difference to where that we have a have an ability to to reduce the uh, the amount of suicide in the in the uh, in the state. Um, I I understand the argument that was made by Mr. For Farmer that uh, you know the health standards that's where they should be located. If you have them in there, then then it would be considered. Um, but if we don't do anything, it's my experience that uh, uh, that topic will be ignored because there is enough on the plate for, for our teachers to do everything that they have. So if you want suicide, suicide to be addressed in the health standards, I think that it almost has to be from a legislative mandate, whether it's shall or may. Um, I, I heard the the um, uh, the the evil word of you know what's it going to cost us? I think that the cost becomes minimalized when you have trained people within the district to where that they can um, go on and teach uh, staff members all the way down to students, uh, and if they have a commitment to. Uh, to refresh that, which is one of the things that this, the Jason Flat Act did, is, is that you have to do this on a rotating basis to where that it stays fresh, to where that uh, teachers remember what uh, the, the signs of suicide are and, uh, and hopefully have, um, um, have an effect. But I think we need to do something. And if we don't, I think that we're just going to continue to have the high suicide rates that we have. Uh, starting my um, teaching career in 1979, Wyoming was in the top three then. It's not the, late, the recent 10 years. It's been a long systemat systematic um, problem in the state. And, and sooner or later, we're going to have to deal with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Ellis, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, it's mine is back to how we structure our statutes. And if you look at 21-9-101, this um, is our common core of knowledge and our common core of skills. And we keep talking about, well, what may come off the plate? Maybe it's personal financial management skills. That's in the basket. The other things that we talked about, um, providing some training for victims of sexual assault, that's not in the basket. So it really is for me, this ongoing conundrum of how do we, if we want to value suicide prevention, where do we put it and how do we place it? When we start integrating it into the basket, I feel like it transforms from something that you can get an outside volunteer group back to the CPR example, having, um, you know, volunteer firefighters come in and do your CPR training as a one hour session or a two hour session to when it's in the basket, is that something we're starting to expect our educators to be able to provide? And so I do have, I'm just uncertain of how that, that works. And I just wanna know if there's a better way if anyone has something. Um, but one thing I just wanna point out that is troubling to me is, you know, even in Cheyenne, we've got three high schools and a good friend of mine has worked on suicide prevention. She indicated to me that she was welcome to come talk to a group of kids at I think one of the high schools, but not the other two. So there's an inconsistency within our school district and down to financial management, I think one of our high schools has a very robust financial management or financial life skill management program and the other two don't. And so um, I just don't think, I'm just a little critical of what we're doing here and you know the reach of how uniform um, what we're providing already is and then adding something like suicide prevention. Um, I'm just, I, I structurally don't understand how this, what we're trying to achieve um, or maybe the best way of achieving what we're trying to get after, which is ultimately keeping our students safe by giving them more tools to address suicide prevention. So if anyone has any thoughts, I'm just looking at our statutes. Thank you. Representative Simpson. Mr. Chairman, what a nice dialogue. Thank you very much. You have inspired me to share my thoughts. Um, 
I'm very much supportive of this bill. I think that it's a problem and we need to address it. And I think by advancing this bill, it'll, it'll really bring things back to the discussion and encourage more activity. On this amendment, however, interesting enough, I'm gonna to vote to keep it a May. And the reason I am is all about, are we going up or down? I think the appropriate way to do this is for the citizens to approach their school district board and say, we want this taught in our schools. That's the way it should be. I'm sensitive about us leaders mandating it back down to the school districts when some school districts may not have a problem, may not think it's a problem, may not want to be involved in it. I, I really am an advocate of citizens coming up, but I think that they should be coming up to the school board, not to the legislature. So I'm gonna be a no on the amendment, but I really like the bill and will support it. Further comments on the amendment? Now I'm hearing, oh, there we go, Senator Rothfuss, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to provide some final thoughts if it, it looks like everybody else has done. And, and in particular, I wanted to address uh, Senator Ellis's question about the structure. Um, I, I think, we have had a number of pieces of legislation similar to this over the years, and we've done them differently. And actually the way that this is structured with the amendment is probably the way that we should have done the CPR bill and the uh, sexual assault awareness legislation. Uh, because with the shall in place, what it does, Mr. Chairman, is it, it basically calls out specifically within the common core of knowledge, the health and safety component of that common core and says that this, the suicide prevention awareness shall be taught if we have the shall uh, as part of that. In other words, it, it, it basically is a requirement that it be within that component of statute, which would then effectively require the State Board of Education to include it as part of the standards. We're basically calling out a component of the Common Core and requiring that this be taught within it. So if we wanted to go back and revisit the good Senator Land and CPR legislation, I think this is how we should have done it. Uh, and again, I supported it then. I supported it as a shall then. I supported the sexual assault awareness as a shall. And, and I think this is the way to actually get to it. Now, it might not be perfect and there might be better ways. And maybe we need to be a little more specific if we continue to work this bill on how to call that out and, and make it go that specific way so that it gets incorporated into the standards as they're being promulgated. Uh, so I appreciate the thoughts that Senator Ellis has provided in terms of us trying to get the process right as we look at this. But thinking back on the other pieces of legislation that we worked over the years where we ended up with Mays, and not a lot has happened as a result of it, and thinking through this structure, it seems to me that it's, it's probably the best that we've come up with. Mr. Chairman, the final thought is the shall to make concept and whether we should be doing this ourselves or whether we should be leaving it up to school districts. I think what it comes down to is just to look at the past. Uh, of course, school districts could be doing this. Of course they can. But not a lot of them have done it as robustly as they need to. And we can look to the data and the fact that we have time and time again, year in, year out, been among the very worst states, if not the worst state, when it comes to suicide. So doing the same thing again, just doesn't seem like it's the solution to me. A may is effectively the same thing. They've always been able to maybe get this done. We're saying as the legislature, if we pass this shall, if we pass this legislation, that we want to take it more seriously in the future. We want to do things differently and we want to prescribe the requirement that this be taught to all students through the health and safety component of our common core of knowledge and as such, I, I think the shall is the best way to pursue that. So I hope the committee will support both the amendment and the legislation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Very good. Anybody else? Nice wrap up. Thank you. We're on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, raise your hand, please.
six, seven, eight. We have eight in favor against. Four, five against. So the amendment passes. We're back on the bill. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to add to the bill or any other further comments or additions, amendments? First on the bill, Mr. Chairman. There you go. Thank you. All right. Mr. Senator Mr. Ellis. Senator Ellis has, yeah. Yeah, my, um, my question goes to Representative Landon's point about cost. And again, it's the structure of how we fund our education model. And I lived through this with um, school security. Um, we talked about it when we talked about CPR to adequately fund whatever resources a district needs. If we're adding this then into something that's supposed to be integrated into the basket rather than as an add-on, how do we, how does this go forward then with recalibration? Is this like in a future five year, in five years when the recalibration committee meets again, that's when we cost it. Like it's again, back to the structural thing. I think the sooner we as a legislature start figuring out how this all works and the cost benefit, not the cost benefit, because I don't think you put a lot of cost on lives, but just so that we as a legislature know what happens when we do this. I struggle with this. It's, it's a really messy part of how we do education. And I just want to make sure that that's clear going forward. And I, it's still not clear at all to me. Go ahead, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just briefly again, um, I, I want to I want to caution the committee. We heard from 11 people here today, which is a, a pretty remarkable amount of people that like to speak or that will speak. Um, and I think the Zoom platform has, has graciously afforded a lot more people the opportunity to speak on pieces of legislation than what we would normally see across the state. Uh, but I do want to caution uh, those that we did not hear their voices of. Uh, the teachers, the teachers that are in the classroom uh, that are dealing with this on a daily basis. And they are the ones that are pressed for the time. They are the ones that have the, the lack of ability to squeeze something in or drop something off. Uh, they're required by their state standards to practice this, uh, to do that, and, and here and there on a, on a constant basis. And so uh, I, I am just going to, to stand firm on this, that I do believe that, yes, we did hear some very powerful testimony today, but we also did not hear from everybody. Um, and so we heard from one side of the story. And I want, I want the committee to be very, very judicious in what we're doing here. Uh, we're not passing the bill here, right? We're, we're, we're passing this to be a, a committee-sponsored bill. So uh, this will see its due time as we move forward. But um, I, I, I just want to make sure that we all understand that, that, that we did not hear anybody against this that's doing this on the front lines. We heard from the psychologists and the principals and some superintendents, but they're not the ones with the feet on the ground on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So uh, for that reason, I'll be on and against the bill. Representative Pieperino. You're muted, Gary. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I attended a professional development yesterday in which the presenter indicated that we need to create a system of K through 22 to address all the standards that are coming down to teachers and to school districts. We don't have that kind of time. We don't have that kind of money. Many districts throughout the state now have looked at standards and they're now prioritizing those standards because there's so many of them. Um, it's a concern for me as a teacher of 30 years to see how much has been heaped on that, that basket, heaped into that basket here. Um, there's a few of us here that have been involved in education, and we see that. We work on that full time here. Uh, it's mind boggling the kind of things that the state wants the school districts to perform like the schools are the answer for all of society's ills. And it's very difficult, very demanding to take care of that. Um, I was one of those who voted to keep it at May. We've heard from many people in Park County. We heard from Representative Simpson who pulled his Lincoln County. There may be some other districts who are um, want to perform some robust work on this type of thing. I would like to see what those districts who already have bought into these things 
to allow them through the May to do these things. And if, again, if they really, really have buy-in, we can look to their data in subsequent years to see whether this process has really affected the, the numbers that our state's looking at. I'm not so sure education can solve all the society's ills. And because it's changed to a, a shall, I will be against the bill. Go ahead, Representative Obermiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanna to speak to the, you know, the kids that testified today and Cody, uh, I think they helped uh, raise this issue to a level that uh, deserves the attention of the whole legislature and, and not just this committee. No matter whether, you know, my vote was a vote that allowed this topic to move forward and have all the discussions that people are talking about, hearing from others, uh, but it needs to rise to the level of something that gets to the floor of the house. Uh, committees need to operate as gatekeepers, not allow everything to move forward. But I think this one, because of the testimony we heard, particularly from the kids today, that it deserves a hearing from the whole body. And that's the, that's the nature of my affirmative vote today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna ask Josh for a roll call on the bill. Chairman North, if I'm gonna go ahead and take the vote on the bill, if you don't mind. Great, thank you, Karen. All right, Senator Ellis. Aye. Senator Hutchins. No. Senator Landon. Aye. Senator Rothfuss. Aye. Representative Brown. No. Representative Connolly. Aye. Representative Flitner. No. Representative Freeman. Aye. Representative Obermuller. Aye. Representative Paxton. Aye. Representative Piperinen. No. Representative Simpson. Aye. Co-Chairman Coe. Aye. Co-Chairman Northrop. Aye. You have 10 ayes, four noes. Thank you. So the bill is passed. Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If any other of you committee members have the same concerns I do, I just think we're gonna see more bills like this kind of going forward. And I think that they're all legitimate um, dialogues and questions that we need to address because at the end of the day, it's about saving kids' lives. I would love to give some thought to how we do this structurally within our statutes, what we're requiring as standards, what isn't standards. I just think we need to shine a light and have a little bit more transparency over um, you know, what adding something into the day means that we're areas that we maybe need to ask the state board then to say, okay, weaken your standard here. Um, we all probably should have a better command then of the health and safety um, standards as they exist today. I just think if we're going down this path, we need to be a lot more thoughtful in how we tackle these very type, these very similar types of issues when it comes to cost and what's on the the day-to-day the -day plate of students and teachers who's gonna be teaching them, that, those kind of things. So if anyone would like to work on that between now and when we meet again as a legislature, um, and maybe as a little forewarning that might affect how this bill is structured. Um, but I, I think we need to do that work. Senator Landon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I certainly can't argue with, with any of that. I, um, you know, just a couple of thoughts. Um, having gone through what we did uh, with respect to uh, our visits about computer science uh, that went in front of our state board. Um, you know, we, we referenced uh, CPR several times this morning. Uh, the fact that that was something like five years ago. Um, I would point this morning to the committee that we had testimony. I specifically asked, you know, what sort of impact is this going to have financially on our districts? And at least the testimony this morning was that it was going to be negligible because we provide prevention funding. Now, we all know that that could be in jeopardy. I don't know what's gonna to happen to the prevention money that we're able to provide at the state level. Um, but I, you know, I, 
again, I can't argue with the fact that some of these do affect the boots on the ground and, and we're going to we're going to be asking our instructors out across the state, you know, to work this in. And uh, that may lead to a reduction in another emphasis in that particular class. But um, that's my thoughts. I think, I think that we've done a good thing uh, to move this forward and to have this conversation. And maybe we can flush it out a little bit better. Um, many of us may not be specifically involved with this committee going forward, but I know that we're going we're gonna to retain our desire to help and to work on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good job. Senator Office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I do think that there needs to be more work uh, pursuant to what Senator Ellis is saying about how we structure this and how we get this done. Uh, but I also think that the suggestion that was raised by Mr. Farmer is a good one where uh, parallel paths and, and maybe that is another route, we can see how effective it is where we write a letter uh, along the same lines and, and realistically writing a letter uh, that doesn't just advocate as we're working these standards for suicide prevention awareness, but you get back to the CPR considerations of Senator Landon. We can put that in the letter right now. You get back to the discussion that Senator Ellis said earlier about the fact that our, our sexual assault awareness, while we passed legislation that had a main, it really has not been adopted. Um, I, I do think that we should contemplate sending a letter. I don't know that we need a motion right now. I actually think maybe giving it some thought and working on it later might be the way to do it. Uh, but I'd ask the committee, and maybe we're going to a break now, um, to contemplate over the break and over the afternoon of writing that letter and what we should include it in it, what we should advocate for as they look at their health and safety uh, standards. And, and weighing in is, is a great thing for us to do, in my opinion, even if we don't directly affect it. Uh, having them understand our priorities would potentially be helpful. So I'll, I'll just ask the committee to give some thought to that. Maybe we can contemplate a motion for later in the day. All right. So Senator Ellis, go ahead. Along those lines, Mr. Chairman, when we're talking about the health and safety of our students, you know, it's one thing when another fellow classmate notices the sign of suicide amongst a, a peer. But if we're talking about asking our students to really perk up their ears and, and report, we should be talking about school safety. What if they're aware that that student might pose a threat to other students? To me, these are all very linked issues. And so to only hear kind of through the lens of suicide prevention, I think is, is just too narrow of a focus. If we're asking our students to be really informed about keeping their school safe, we should broaden that look to, do you see signs amongst your peers that they're willing to commit violence against their classmates or their teachers? So just something else for to muddy the water, Mr. Chairman. Very good. All right, we're gonna take a short break, um, 10 minutes. It's gonna be 10, it's 10.38 right now. We'll be back here at 10.48, thank you.
Hi, Scott. How you doing? Sorry, I was muted there. I'm, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you guys. Yeah. It was a longer than expected uh, pregame session there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> good subject. Yes. Yes. We've all had our lives touched by suicide. So everybody no kidding. Has, yeah. got a, something to say. Yeah. I was going to say, Mr. Chairman, we do have two grants that we recently received, a Stop School Violence Grant and a, a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Awareness Grant that we just received as a department. If you'd like, I can share that information with you to send on to the rest of the committee. Yeah, why don't you do that by email so we, we don't mm -hmm. take time during this committee yeah, meeting. I didn't think it was worth, yeah, I didn't think it was worth the actual meeting time, but I figured the committee members might be interested in that. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you guys to keep it a little short just because we got to make up a little bit of time. Not much, but we have to, we're going to take a little bit out of noon lunch. We'll take out 15 minutes out of that and we're just going to par it down a little everywhere. So, yep, we could do that. So Matt, I don't know if you're on yet. Will you give us the ability to share or do we automatically have it? Good morning, Scott. We'll, uh, Good to we'll see you. you. Yeah, you too. We'll give you the, uh, we'll give you guys the ability to share your screens. I know you guys have uh, multiple presentations, so it's yeah. a little bit easier from your end to uh, yeah. uh, coordinate all those. Great. Thank you.
Not a quorum yet. We're working on it. You're doing a nice job, Mr. Chairman, but you're running a little bit behind. Yeah, it's but, it, uh, it, you know, you know, I can work with you a little bit over the moon hour. Thank you. <laughs> Bring your hot shot, would you? <laughs> Boy, there's my old buddy Scott Marion. How are you, Scott? Good. How are you doing, Senator? Good well, to see I'm you. Fine. Good. Good to see you again. Yeah, I wish I could be there in person. So do we. Wish I could be anywhere else in person other than here. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'd, like to, I'd, I'd like to be anywhere in person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. We're going to continue this meeting. So we're back going. The first thing we need to do is go back and pick up the minutes from September 3rd. Do we have anybody that would like to make a motion on the minutes? I'll move for the adoption of the minutes. Second. Moved and seconded. Moved by Senator Landon. Seconded by Senator Rothfuss just because he made the motion also. Okay. Any comments on the minutes? None appearing. We'll proceed to vote. All those in favor for signify by raising your hand. All right. We've approved the minutes. Thank you. That takes us back to K-12 education program. We're going to start out with Kerry Aikens. Aikens and Kari, it's all yours. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Kari Aikens, the Chief Policy Officer at the Wyoming Department of Education. As you'll recall, at the last meeting um, earlier this year of the Joint Education Committee, Superintendent Bailo addressed the committee about um, wanting to make some progress in competency-based education. And so we have brought some wonderful um, friends from the Center for Assessment and Knowledge Works. And so I will actually go ahead and toss it to Scott Marion from the Center of Assessment to get us going with these presentations. Thanks, Kari. Um, good morning, I guess it's afternoon here. Good afternoon, uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to see you. Uh, like I said, I wish I could be there in person. So I am gonna share my screen. You guys should all see that, right? Okay, great. Senator Rothis, I like the beard. <laughs> so um, I have my uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Lillian Pace and uh, Carla uh, uh, from KnowledgeWorks here. Uh, they will be carrying the, uh, the bulk of the presentation about competency and personalized learning. I'm gonna set the stage a little bit. We're gonna talk about the why, what, and how of competency-based education. And so we just heard it in the previous uh, discussion. I was uh, watching you guys on YouTube, on the YouTube channel. And uh, so we just heard about the basket of goods and all these standards in now 10 content areas. Uh, we have the state assessments in language arts and mathematics and science and district assessments to document student opportunities in all 10 areas, um, as well as providing some documentation that students are ready to graduate from high school. So we have to ask, how has it worked? Um, I, I think the basket of goods and the associated standards, assessment, certification, et cetera, has been incredibly valuable for developing shared understandings of quality across Wyoming. And together with the funding model, because they go hand in hand, as you are all well uh, familiar, um, has helped improve this performance of the state's most disadvantaged students. Every uh, year that uh, the National Assessment of Educational Progress is released, um, I'm always uh, pleased to see that Wyoming's uh, economically da disadvantaged students always seem to finish in the top five uh, nationally. That was pretty impressive, and you guys should be proud of that. Um, but we have to ask now, is this the, is this the time, uh, is this the approach that can take Wyoming's educational system to the next level? Um, you know, I say do the math, right? And so, you know, high school algebra alone uh, includes about 20 content standards. And if that's typical, you know, you multiply that by 10 content areas and four years of high school. So this isn't even an algebra problem. This is, a, you know, a third grade arithmetic problem. And uh, you get into, a, a, you know, a large number of standards, which we worry that could, I was worried back when I was there 20 years ago, this can turn things into a checklist mentality. And so what do I mean by that? Um, so just 
I won't go into this, but you know, here's an example of an algebra one standard, not even algebra two. And I want to know, you know, when did you last use this standard? Um, anybody there other than Senator Rothis. Um, and so it's uh, <laughs> oh, Senator uh, Representative North or he did too as well. So that's good. Um, you know, so we we're really want to shift and to talk about the next level to this notion of deeper learning and deeper understanding. Well, why do we care about that? Because kids are constantly now and adults are constantly, as we all know, faced with problems that we've never seen before. The world is changing rapidly. Technology is changing rapidly. And we have to be able to, uh, we can't just say, oh, I learned this in ninth grade. I could do exactly that now. I have to be able to apply what I've learned to situations I've never seen before. And how do we do that? That requires deeper understanding and not shallow understanding in order to do that. And so, you know, we, we talk about, uh, you know, like 21st century skills, and we've been talking about that for a long time. We started talking about it before the 21st century. You know, now we're a fifth of the way into it, and, you know, we're still talking about it, and it's time to really uh, be acting on it. So this is a, you know, a little joke, right? Saying if you'd been a little more proficient in math, this would have never happened. Right, but this, the idea that we do care about deep learning, and so we we base it on this research on learning, and uh, with the the picture on the left there is really you know various uh, neurons and the, and the connections, and that's that's the key part, right? Deeper learning requires cultivating connections across content areas and even within content areas across you know what might see, uh, see, be seen as uh, different kinds of concepts within content areas and across content areas, as well as certain types of cross-cutting skills that we talk about, like critical thinking, like collaboration, like communication. And, and by you know, building those uh, connections, we're able to activate these deeper neurological uh, connections as well. Focusing on individual standards and checking them off doesn't cultivate these connections and doesn't foster deeper learning in the same way. So here's an example, and Carla's gonna talk a little bit more about this, uh, or maybe Lillian is. Um, this is just an example from just a little south in Utah. And I'm you know, not selling this as an endorsement, but when you ask parents, when you ask business people, what kind of knowledge and skills do they want kids to have to be able, their kids or people they want to employ? You hear them talk about things like digital literacy, collaboration and teamwork, critical thinking and problem solving, honesty, integrity, responsibility, right? Hard work and resilience. Those are the kinds of things you hear people talk about mostly when they're thinking about kids' futures. Um, and so, you know, perhaps it's time for us to think about, you know, are we stuck in this mentality of 10 content areas and lots of standards in each content area and expecting kids to check off each standard or should we be focusing on, on bigger pictures, bigger picture items? So I know that uh, the state board with uh, some support from uh, uh, the Aurora Institute and other organizations, uh, Center for uh, Innovation Education, are working on a portrait of a graduate or profile of a graduate. And many states have uh, engaged in this sort of work to identify what I call these big picture competencies, like the picture I just showed you in Utah. But there's their end of school, their end of high school uh, competencies. They can provide an important beacon of where we want to go but they don't get you there, right? They don't, they don't uh, chart the course. They, they just, they point out the important end goal. And so there's a number of ways to get there. Um, my colleagues, Lily and, and, uh, and Carla are gonna talk about competency and personalized learning. But I, I, don't, I want people to not lose sight of the idea. It's not exactly how we get there. It's important though that we get there, that we move through these, helping kids be prepared for these deeper learnings and being able to navigate the, the ever-changing world in the future. So uh, Representative Northrup, Chairman Northrup asked me to be quick. I hope that was not too quick. I'm going to turn it over to Lillian and, uh, and she's going to take it from here. Uh, and we'll, uh, Kari will f facilitate questions and answers uh, 
you could ask the questions, she'll do the answers, and, uh, and we'll, uh, um, after Lillian and Carla. So Lillian, it's all yours. Thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you to the chairman and to the members of the committee. It's an honor to be here, um, even if we have to do it through a computer, but hopefully we'll have just as productive a conversation. Um, as, as Scott uh, shared, um, you know, KnowledgeWorks is a nonprofit organization that has been partnering with uh, states and districts to transform systems to be more personalized and competency-based. We tackle both the policy and the practice, um, and uh, both Carla and myself uh, here today are representing the policy side of our shop. So we are eager to answer any of the great questions that you'll have. Uh, to get us started, I'm going to um, cover a little bit deeper lens into the why that Scott started, um, why we are seeing more and more states begin to focus on competency-based education. I'll then look at the what uh, so we can better understand exactly what this approach to teaching and learning looks like. Um, and then I'm going to give you a sneak preview into some of the early research. Um, what is the evidence base that's building uh, to validate positive outcomes for both students and teachers for this approach? So to jump in, uh, we'll start with the why. Um, I, I'm sure you've heard many times uh, people speak to the disconnect between the K-12 education system and our post-secondary and workforce systems. And you can see that in this data here before you. If you look at the pie chart on the left, we are celebrating the highest graduation rates in the nation right now at 84%. We've made significant progress. But what's unfortunate is when we hand students a diploma as they walk across the stage uh, or in maybe, in a, maybe through a virtual ceremony these days, um, we're promising them that they're ready. But what we find is that these students are actually not ready. Many of them are requiring remedial courses when they enter into post-secondary. So if you look at that chart in the middle, 28 to 40% of students are requiring remedial courses. And of those students who are taking the remedial courses, less than 50% are completing them. At the same time, we see these gaps playing out in our workforce system. So employers are saying that um, of the, the critical skills that they expect you know, their employees to have, only 77% are proficient in teamwork, 56% in problem solving, 43% in work ethic, and 42% in communication. And if we think about this gap playing out uh, into the future, if we look at our, our gaps on the horizon, this is only going to get worse unless we do something. So if you look at the three bar graphs there in the middle, if you look at the top two colors, the, the brown and the, the turquoise color, these are our physical and manual skills and our basic cognitive skills. You know, are our, 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 our employees able to pay attention and memorize basic concepts? And you'll see that heading into 2030, that is shrinking, right? And if you look at the bottom three colors in the chart, these are our higher cognitive skills, our social emotional skills, our technological skills. The demand for those is growing and we're gonna to need to figure out a way to build education systems that are preparing our students to be successful in those areas. So the good news is we don't have to, to live with these gaps. We actually have a pretty good idea about how we can begin to shift systems to prepare each student for future success through competency education. So what is competency education? Um, I, I know a lot of times it's sort of shortened to, it's a chance to, to focus on outputs and not seat time. And I think there's a lot of truth to that, but let's dig under the hood and get into the specifics. Um, now, we had provided a video, um, I know that uh, was shared with the committee uh, prior to this, so we'll go ahead and skip over that, um, but uh, certainly recommend if you haven't had a chance to watch that, we've played that with other states, and it does a really good job of providing visuals from the classroom to help you really understand what it is. At KnowledgeWorks, our definition um, really focuses on what we call personalized and competency-based learning. Um, you're going to hear a lot of different terms when states um, or organizations talk about competency education. Um, you might hear mastery-based learning, proficiency-based learning, standards-based standards learning, and KnowledgeWorks, we use personalized and competency-based learning. And the reason we do so is we believe that if you just focus on the competency-based learning piece, which is using time differently and emphasizing uh, outputs and mastery of learning, 
without the personalization, you could just see equity gaps exacerbate, right? And that's not what we want in our system. So our seven components, which are adapted from the Aurora Institute's uh, definition, um, focus on learner agency. Are students empowered uh, to have a voice in their learning, to uh, decide how they're going to demonstrate mastery and partnership with their teachers? Um, are assessments flexible and meaningful? So, you know, how are we using assessments to inform instruction instead of just to administer at the end of the year? Um, are students able to progress upon mastery, right? That's a key piece uh, of this. And how are we using time and, and learning pathways differently? There's also a culture of equity that is embedded in uh, not just the instructional practices, but also every element of the system, including the policy systems that empower uh, practitioners on the ground. And the last piece is that the learning targets are explicit, transparent, measurable, and transferable. So if you had a chance to watch that video or if you do in the future, you'll, you'll really be struck by the way students actually can speak to, even at as young age as you know, first and second grade, what learning targets they're working on, what's expected of them to demonstrate mastery and how excited they get when they're progressing you know, through, through their competency-based progression. So that's a comprehensive definition, but let's look at the way it's defined in some of uh, the states uh, nearby. Uh, so Utah, competency-based education means a system where a student advances to higher levels of learning when the student demonstrates competency of concepts and skills regardless of time, place, or pace. So that's one definition in statute. And here's another in Idaho. So mastery-based education means an education system where student progress is based on a student's demonstration of mastery of competencies and content, not seat time or the age or grade level of the student. So both of these definitions are really emphasizing that demonstration of mastery over seat time. And that's a critical component. And as my co colleague Carla will share soon, she will explain how these states are actually uh, building out supporting tools and frameworks to really get at that level of personalization to ensure that this is being implemented in a high quality way. So just to spotlight, you know, if we really dig into a classroom, what, how does this look or feel different? Um, at KnowledgeWorks, we've created a resource that um, compares a traditional education system to a competency-based system. So I'll highlight um, some of these uh, big differentiators. So if we think about the learning continuum, so in a traditional system, we know students are expected to master grade level, college and career standards. In a competency-based system, as Scott alluded, you know, we're gonna evolve beyond the standards. We're building on the standards. They're our backbone, but we're actually gonna build in critical competencies that we know are successful, are essential for success in post-secondary and career. And we're also going to build that out into transferable learning objectives that students can use to be empowered in their own learning. The pace, um, you know, this is a, a, a big one that people talk about in competency education. Obviously, in a, in a traditional system, you often have educators saying, you know, we're going to focus on this set of standards for this week and then we're going to move on. And we use time differently in a competency-based system. Um, but what's really important is that students are receiving customized support both in school and out of school to make sure that even if they need a little time, that they're still staying on a pace to graduate college and career ready. School culture. So in a traditional classroom, you know, we see, you know, all learning is happening typically within the four walls of a classroom. Um, from an instructional standpoint, you know, typically a teacher's standing in the front uh, delivering sort of a one size fits all curriculum. Um, in a competency based classroom, uh, we are seeing really rich learning experiences co designed by educators and community partners, maybe employers with great internship programs and educators are, are working collaboratively to design these unique learning pathways for every student based on their interests and their post secondary and career aspirations. And, and lastly, assessment. So as I uh, mentioned earlier in our definition, assessment is a critical piece of a competency-based system. But we don't think of assessment typically as just that sort of annual summative multiple choice test, you know, that we're familiar with in our current systems. 
we think about a comprehensive assessment system where formative assessments are guiding daily instruction, where students have the opportunity to take summative assessments when they're ready to demonstrate mastery, and they might even have multiple chances to demonstrate mastery because the importance is that they have mastered the content at the end of the day. And grades, um, grades are in a traditional system. They're usually norm referenced, um, often based on weighted quarters and a final exam. In a competency-based system, they're gonna center around mastery of these competencies. And what's really great is when you get to the end of a school year, if a student hasn't passed the content, in a traditional system, they might get held back and have to repeat the entire year. In a competency-based system, we can focus in specifically on the competencies where we know that student needs a little extra support and hopefully catch them up quickly so they are back on pace with their peers. So I'll just go really quickly through what competency education is not uh, in the interest of time, but I do wanna flag a couple of these points. Um, you know, so, so as Scott mentioned, this is not a checkbox of activities, right? This is really deep project-based, pathway-based learning where students are um, given the opportunity to go really deeply into things that interest them. Um, it's also not adult-centered and it's certainly done with the engagement of the entire community. I'm gonna flag a couple myths that we hear often in our field. Um, one is that deadlines are dead in a CBE model. Um, there's this notion that if you just take away time, students will just progress at their own time and, and there will be no structure. And um, that's not true at all. In fact, in a competency education classroom, there is still a class pace that's formatively set by the teachers. And teachers know what students might need a little extra time and they know what students are ready to accelerate ahead, but they're still moving students through in a similar path, again, to make sure that everyone's tracking to be uh, successful by either the end of the year or by, again, graduation. We often get a lot of pushback. This is something that's been playing out uh, in, a, in a very uh, misinformed way in the media is that personalized or competency-based learning is equivalent to putting a student in a chair in front of a computer all day. Um, that is, could not be farther from the truth. Um, we always say that a competency-based approach um, is not contingent on technology at all. Um, it can be a great enabler. I mean, ed educators can certainly use technology to um, uh, better differentiate and serve students, but it is not essential. And, and certainly, you know, all of the classrooms at KnowledgeWorks supports, uh, it is just one factor of many that are at play. And similarly, the role of the teacher is not diminished in a CBE system. Again, if you uh, think about competency education as putting kids in front of a computer, you might come to that conclusion. But these are really rich in-person models where teachers become more essential than ever. Uh, we really elevate their profession um, to design these rich learning pathways in partnership with the community to really empower students to have a voice in their own learning. And the last myth I'll flag, you know, is, well, how could this even be possible? You can't personalize instruction for all learners. Um, we're not proposing an approach where you have 25 to 30 individual lesson plans. Um, it's really about, again, those clear learning targets, empowering students um, to have their own voice and to go deep into their content and, and to have educators and community partners, you know, really support them in their success and to know when to provide more extensive supports as necessary. So the evidence base, I'll just wrap up with a very quick preview into the evidence base. There have been um, three, you know, sort of high level national studies done uh, recently on uh, competency education. Um, two were done by RAND, uh, one in 2015, one in 2017, and then one was uh, conducted um, by the American Institutes for Research in 2018. And what I will say is, you know, these studies are still early, as you can imagine. Uh, many of the schools that they're serving are in the early stages of implementation. But what's really exciting is we're already seeing some, some really, really exciting positive results. And so I'm gonna share some of that with you. And, and each of these slides has the, the research citation at the bottom. So if you are one of those people that loves to dig under the hood and get into the evidence base, you certainly are welcome to, to read those studies. 
So the first um, is that students in schools using personalized learning are making greater student achievement gains in math and reading. And students who are starting out behind are now catching up. For students who are given extra time to finish a topic or a unit, those that are given the opportunity to retake an exam or redo a final project in mathematics actually saw more positive self-efficacy. Having access to non-traditional assessments was positively associated with intrinsic motivation. This is a, a particularly exciting one. This was done of a study of a uh, school in Colorado, a district in Colorado that's implementing a full competency-based approach. 43% to 47% of students who were behind their traditional grade levels completed their performance levels in three or fewer quarters, less time than it would take in a traditional education system. Students with greater exposure to proficiency-based practices, that's just another term for competency education, tended to demonstrate higher levels of engagement. And reading and math scores um, were higher in students participating in personalized learning schools. And we found that, this, the, the study found that uh, uh, folks implementing personalized learning actually benefited students of all ability levels. This is one of my favorites and the one I will end my presentation on. You know, oftentimes we talk about different teaching and learning models and it might, one approach might benefit those who are below grad, grade level more. One approach might benefit students who are higher and need to be accelerated and challenged. And one of the beautiful things about personalized and competency-based learning is this model actually can challenge every single student, no matter where they are, and can make sure that every single student succeeds. And so with that, I'm gonna pass to, oh wait, I'm sorry, one more. Um, one more in here. This is a great one because you'll get questions potentially from teachers, right? Um, in higher education, student-centered approaches or teaching have been found to correlate with greater teacher satisfaction, less teacher burnout. And because those instructors are engaged in implementing student-centered practices, they saw improved engagement and higher academic achievement. So I'm gonna to pass to my colleague, Carla. Um, she is gonna really get into the topic I know you guys are, are curious about. Um, she's gonna talk about what this all means for state policy. Good afternoon, I am Carla phillips Kravikis, the Senior Policy Director at KnowledgeWorks. And um, I know you guys have all been given copies of the slides that are attached to the agenda. So in support of the agenda and the time frame, I will go through many of them a little bit quickly, but know that you can obviously follow up with Lillian and I at any time if you have further questions, want actual bill, uh, bills and links from other states, we're happy to provide that. So I wanna to talk to you about some of the ways that states can encourage and support competency-based education. And many of these approaches will also help support some of the issues that Lillian tried to address. And one of which is the idea of a state framework. I have three examples for you. The first one is from Idaho and it was just released this past summer. So the goal of the state framework is to build off the definition and provide more clarity on the expectations. So real quick, I wanna remind you, this is what the Idaho definition was that you saw with Lillian. This is in statute. But often when people see these kind of baseline uh, definitions, the follow-up question is, what does this look like? What does it really mean? So a framework is an opportunity for a state to build that out. The text that you see on the right is actually the legislative intent that was in the bill that created the Mastery Education Pilot Program in Idaho. So when they created the framework, they took the four components, as you can see in red, come directly out of that legislative intent. So the framework should provide consistency and clarity and expectations, yet still provide ample room for local design and implementation. And I know that's super important. And that's one of the reasons that we love this approach is because the state can provide guidance and a framework, but local schools can still design programs that meet the needs of their students in their local communities. So I have a couple more examples for you that I will go through quickly. And again, please feel free to follow up with us and we can provide you more direct links or actual uh, 
bill drafts as well. This is Utah's competency-based education framework. It was loosely modeled after a national model called the LEAP Innovation Framework. And again, you can see it really just has four simple components of being learner-led, learner-demonstrated, learner-focused, and learner-connected. But the booklet that you see on the right-hand side I wanted to point out has a, a breakout of each of these four, and they actually connected each of these four things to the teacher standards in Utah. So educators could see the direct connection. But Utah did not stop there. As Scott already showed you, they went on to also develop a portrait of a graduate. And then the Utah State Board of Education adopted personalized competency-based learning as one of its four goals in its five-year strategic plan. So as a result, they built out this bigger personalized competency-based framework. And I know this is a lot of terminology and a lot of examples, but again, I just wanna emphasize that these are just ways that states are being able to build out that definition and provide a little bit more clarity. And finally, I have the example of South Carolina. They had a profile of a South Carolina graduate actually developed primarily by the business community, which is a really great story we would love to share with you when we have more time, because then the state board came along and, and adopted that, as well as the State School Administrators Association. And it's really now uh, using Scott's term, the beacon for all things in South Carolina is their portrait of a graduate. And then on the left, you see their framework for personalized learning and the Department of Education really sees personalized learning as the avenue in which to achieve the profile of all students. Again, ironically, also four components. I just noticed right now all of them only have, have four components. I don't think that was uh, intentional. So one of the things that we do know is there was a lot happening even before COVID-19. So this is a map that was developed by our friends at the Aurora Institute. And what they are doing was, is kind of evaluating statewide policies. And advanced, so they the categorize the states as advanced, developing, and emergence, emerging. You can see the color coding. The navy blue states were determined to have no activity. Now, if you forward to 2018, you can see that there are 17 advanced states, 14 developing, and 18 emergency. And I'm sure you're noticing that Wyoming is navy blue. But I want to point out that does not mean that competency-based education is not happening in this state. We know that competency-based practices are happening in states in schools all over the country, and I'm sure you know of many in your own state. This is just indicating that as of 2018, Wyoming had not taken a concerted effort to develop a supportive state policy, which is, of course, why we're excited to be here and to talk about that possibility with you. So let me jump right into the fun stuff for you guys. What are the ways that states are actually developing supportive policy? I've broken these out into kind of four big buckets. And again, we're happy to follow up and provide greater detail on all of these states because I love talking about all of them, but in consideration of time, I won't today. But the first one is kind of an obvious one. States develop a competency-based education pilot in statute. Here are some examples of Florida, Illinois, Michigan also come to mind as other examples in Ohio. These are very uh, defined processes in statute with definitions. Idaho and Utah have appropriated money to support them. The second option is innovation programs more broadly. And these include programs that either create innovation zones, districts of innovation, or schools of innovation. Even though the number of participants are limited or subject to incremental increases, the intent is to create a permanent pathway for schools to seek out and utilize flexibility from state laws to try out innovative practices and approaches. Some states put very defined um, ways in which they define innovation. Some states have very broad opportunity for schools to define their own path. Uh, and there was, I believe at last count, 27 of these states. These are just a few of the examples I have for you here. But I want to point out that one of the hallmarks of both pilots and innovation programs is the opportunity for participating districts and schools to identify the laws and policies that present obstacles to innovation and improvement and to request exemption of them. And that's going to come up when we talk about this third bucket of exemptions and waivers. So interest in student-centered approaches has led many states to create or expand authorizing provisions under which a state board of education or the chief state school officer 
can consider or approve exemptions or waivers. But I want to point out, there's a myth, again, that exemptions and waivers are just a way of kind of absolving, okay, district, you never have to worry about that again. That's not really the true intention. The way we envision waivers and exemptions to be used is it's a way to give schools some, some space to develop an innovative approach to a solution or a problem that they can then bring to the state and the state can eventually replicate. And I'll pause for one second to give you one really great state example, and it's Arkansas. They had, I believe, three different ways in statute that you could request a waiver. And over the years, they had adopted literally hundreds of them. But what Arkansas did, which I thought was fantastic a couple of years ago, they went back and researched, read through all the waivers, got the data together. And as a result of those, they were able to redesign their accreditation standards and even take some legislation back to the to the legislature and say, hey, here are, the, here are the big issues that we're hearing from schools over the years and tackle them in a long-term fashion, which is exactly what we would love to see happen. And the last one is enabling uh, policies. Uh, there are lots of different ways that states can enable innovation or competency-based education. I want to point out the one to you because uh, it's your neighbor, Montana, which is really interesting. Their constitution actually states, you know, every state constitution has like the education provision. Montana says that it's the goal of the people to establish a system of education, which will develop the full educational potential of each person. With a strong legacy of local control, Montana has viewed this as a mandate to truly ensure that nothing is preventing schools from meeting the needs of their students and supporting a personalized and proficiency-based approach. And they, for the past 10 years, have been trying to ferret out every possible policy bearing to this work. So that was a really a unique example of actually using a constitutional provision to empower a personalized competency-based education. But the other example, and I believe it came up um, in your last meeting, is the example of New Hampshire. Oftentimes, New Hampshire has been seen as a leader in this work and have been on this journey for about 15 years. But the myth is that they got rid of seat time. And I often like to say that's not really what they did. They did not get rid of seat time. And I'm gonna talk about this more in a minute. They redefined what a credit means. And then by redefining what a credit means, moving away from a time-based approach to a mastery-based approach that enabled schools all over the state to begin this journey. So here are some of the common policy barriers that we see, um, that we not only hear among states, but we see in these waiver applications or in these pilot applications frequently. But um, one of the important lessons I've learned over the years that I was, wanted to share with you was there really are no barriers. There's really nothing in statute or in policy that's preventing schools from embracing competency-based practices. However, there are a lot of barriers, right? I mean, I'm sorry, there are a lot of obstacles, which is different, right? A barrier prevents you from doing it. Obstacles are things that schools have to work around. So I often say that I'm no longer looking for barriers, but I'm looking for the band-aids, the bailing wire, and the duct tape that schools are using on the back end to kind of maneuver through policies that aren't working for them as they try to do things differently. But the other thing that I've learned, and, and you all know this because you do this every day, I can go into just about any state and give you examples how all of these are preventing schools from doing things differently or rethinking education. But finding the solution is a different thing, right? It's easy to kind of point out the problems, but figuring the solution is different and they're very different in each state. So momentum now, things obviously have dramatically changed. And our schools in the past nine months have, have had to undergo monumental changes. But what's interesting is a lot of these issues that we've been discussing, when I'm when we, I mean me, Scott, Lillian, nationally, these issues have now come to the forefront during this crisis. We're now seeing a lot of those issues being dealt with in emergency directives, uh, executive orders, waivers from state chiefs. So now it's the, the cool part for states is now it's very clear what those issues are, at least immediately. And one of the biggest ones has been seat time. So we've been talking about seat time in the context of competency-based education for years, but now obviously moving to a fully distance or even a hybrid-based learning system has really brought seat time to the forefront nationally. 
and uh, Lily and I get calls on this at least weekly from states all over trying to wrestle through this. I often joke uh, that there is no seat time statute. If you Google seat time, it's not a statute, but it manifests itself in states in very two different ways, either through the way states uh, schools are able to issue credit or the way they're funded. And funded, you can actually say it's even really more about how they take attendance and report attendance or membership. The good news is that in New Hampshire, based on our research that we did last year, we see no barriers for school districts to issue credit based on mastery. But the, the local education agencies already have the authority to do that. But the funding piece is, is more nefarious and often it is. And you can see this is the research I'm alluding to that um, Excel and Ed did last year. I was part of this project and it was, I will tell you an anecdotal story. What was really interesting is we had a fleet of attorneys that did this research. They went through all 50 states to evaluate how, what the rules and regulations were for schools to issue credit. And the myth has been that seat time has been such a big barrier. And look at how many were in the no flexibility from seat time, it was zero. And we were shocked by that finding quite honestly. We were surprised at how many uh, schools and states already had that authority, which led us to our, probably our biggest finding in most of this research has been there's a lot of unused or not well understood flexibility already in statute for schools. So let's talk about funding, where I know this one gets, this is, gets difficult. And this is the issue that we've been getting a lot of calls from states all over the country trying to wrestle with time-based funding policies. And we've seen a couple states do some pretty monumental steps, Utah and Kentucky in particular. And I will just tell you, again, this is all happening in real time now. What I'm seeing happen is a, a movement away from time-based reporting structures to more engagement-based reporting structure, reporting based engagement reporting structures. But if you look at your foundational formula, I know uh, you guys are probably well aware of this. This is really where time becomes a problem is how they have to calculate membership, how they, how they take attendance, that sometimes it's the definition of an hour. Some states it's even how uh, part-time or full-time instruction is defined or even how instruction is defined. And I know in Wyoming, I believe you even have teacher pupil contact hours in statute, which I've seen in a couple other states as well that they're wrestling with. But some of the ways that funding, and we'll also talk about funding policies, because I believe this also came up in your last meeting, to enable and support the work. We do see some states, again, I use Idaho and Utah as examples, who have small appropriations. Uh, Idaho is about a million dollars a year. Utah, I think, was $370,000 a year for grants to kick off their, for schools to kick off their work. Some of the state departments are actually raising money through outside philanthropy or small grants from the state or using federal dollars to provide technical assistance and kind of create networks of schools to do the work. And of course, a lot of states and South Carolina is a really good example of it have reallocated their own dollars because they believe so strongly that a personalized competency based system is the way to approach the, the acquisition of a profile of a graduate that they've reallocated the resources within their own department. So I wanted to talk about how you can create the conditions for policy. I know that when you look at the, that list of like seven or eight obstacles, when we're talking about assessment, accountability funding, these are really, really big, difficult policies for states to tackle but I wanna give you the ability to take a breathing room and think about them in the short term and the long term. This is what we've seen as schools begin the transition. But again, they've had to accelerate it under COVID is there are short-term and long-term issues. And the long-term ones are the assessment, accountability and funding. And there can be also incremental as well, right? But short-term, and again, you've probably seen them all just in the past six to nine months in your state. How are schools gonna report attendance? How are they gonna award credit? how the graduation requirements need to be waived or amended in the short term. And teacher record is often a really, not often stated one, but behind the scenes I hear often because as schools are trying to, and I'm even thinking of the email I got from my daughter's teacher this morning, trying to reimagine how and deploy teachers in new and different ways, having teacher record policies can be a real barrier as well or an obstacle. 
And finally, I wanted to leave you with the Knowledge Work State Policy Framework. These are the 12 conditions that we believe in the long run, again, thinking of those long-term policy issues, states really need to tackle to be able to build a supportive system for all schools to be able to make a successful transition and implementation of personalized competence-based learning. And I want to apologize for going so fast, but I want to be sensitive to your schedule and your agenda. And again, I, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to provide much more detail on any of the state examples that we've given as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Chairman, um, right. I'll just uh, wrap things up here uh, by making sure the committee knows that we did, as a department, provide a memo. I believe it's item 302 um, in your meeting materials. And that does show where there are references, specific references to pupil teacher contact in our statutes, um, as well as where there are references in our rules. And so we definitely recognize that there is work that the department and the state board can do to alleviate um, some of the band-aids and uh, you know, ways around that schools are, are having to, things that schools are having to do at this time in order to uh, really implement competency-based education. Um, and then also I did include the reference to competency-based learning that is currently in statute, and that is in our graduation requirements, um, where it does allow evidence of meeting the requirements for graduation to be passing grades or the successful performance on competency-based equivalency examinations. And so, um, you know, we do have the allowance for credit to be awarded without the seat time um, for graduation, and we see that there. Um, but as you um, can see in the, you know, the rules and the statute, the teacher-pupil contact time really results in the funding being based on largely how long students are in school and that specific number of hours that schools have to operate and how they count their attendance. So um, that is an area that um, we as a department and the state board are definitely looking to put some work in to make some changes. But um, I think more than anything, we can see by the fact that, you know, there is that allowance for mastery of credit, but we don't see heavy utilization of that. Um, I, I think that some of that is because there are some misunderstandings and misconceptions about competency-based learning um, and, and how that can be implemented in Wyoming. And so um, for us, we think that especially at a time when we've seen a lot of schools um, starting to make this transition, and I included the example of Upton High School from Weston 7, as well as at the elementary school level, um, it's an ever-increasing number of districts that are moving to standard-based grading for their report cards. Um, and those are all kind of steps along the way of implementing competency-based education. And so I think we really want to make sure that we have a framework that utilizes that um, and recognize that most of our statutes are really based off of that traditional education model. And so there may be um, some obstacles and some hoop jumping that we're making schools do as they move to this competency-based education. So we want to make sure that we have um, that schools have the freedom to move in this direction without having to get past regulatory obstacles. Mr. Very Chairman, good. with that, I'll stand. From the committee. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead, Representative Pete Breen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is is competency based and standards based the same thing? Kari? Mr. Chairman, um, I will let Lillian Pace from Knowledge Works answer that question. Thank you. Go ahead, Lillian. Yes, Representative, often you do hear that as an interchangeable term. The, the important piece there is, are we focusing on mastery of those critical outputs that we know students need to be able to master? And so the common terms are, uh, standards-based was an early term. It was used in New England uh, mostly. Uh, it was a term of um, but certainly proficiency-based, mastery-based learning, competency education, to some extent personalized learning if it has that true use of time differently as well. Further questions? Go ahead, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, mine isn't so much about the content of competency-based learning, but how other states got there. I think that our system is very entrenched. And when I, sitting on the education committee for four years, it is you know talking to folks who say, I've got an idea and I wanna bring it to education and make some changes. I'm like, it's a hard committee and it's hard to make any changes. And so what prompted other states to go down this path? What were some of the barriers? And I think 
I'm trying to understand why there's kind of this reluctance. Um, but that's my concern is how does Wyoming get there? How do we even start seriously entertaining this and getting buy-in from all the stakeholder groups? Because I think my, if I were to guess our districts, I, I think there'd be a lot of pushback on trying to, to shift toward any kind of change like this. So be curious to know your thoughts or how this worked in other states and just kind of what's out there. And if I'm wrong, I'd love to be wrong. Go ahead, Corey. Mr. Chairman, Senator Ellis. So one thing that we have seen um, that has worked well in other states is putting a definition in statute. Uh, and then we've seen a multitude of approaches from other states um, and Carlo went over some of them. Um, so several states started with, you know, those pilot programs or the innovation zones, and it basically created a communication loop with, with their state education department. So then they could really see, you know, what are those regulatory barriers that they're constantly running into as they're looking at, you know, attendance, awarding credits, um, making sure that, you know, hey, if we're saying this kid doesn't have to do four years of English, you know, we want to make sure that competency-based equivalency exam is actually assessing the right thing. Um, so I, I think that, you know, some sort of a pilot program or an innovation zone along with a definition and statute are, are things that we've seen um, be successful in other states. Um, you know, one state that is starting to have a lot of success in this is North Dakota, and they were able to um, use grant funding actually to facilitate um, some of those measures and build out that framework. Fortunately, um, you know, we are already working with our state board on a profile of a graduate, and um, I think that that is one area where, you know, we have all of these things in statute, and really the portrait of a graduate, or the profile of a graduate isn't to say like, hey, we need to change all of this so much, but it's to say we need to make this more understandable so that we have that clear beacon, and then as schools are moving towards that, um, and we are already seeing schools implementing competency-based education, I don't think we are looking at wanting to say all schools have to do this, but I think we are seeing schools move there, we are seeing schools want to move there, um, and because of the positive research that is coming out around it, we want to make sure that they are able to do that. And so um, I think, that, yeah, I'll let um, Lillian or Carla add anything if they want, but um, from what I've learned from working with them, uh, you know, having that clear definition so that, you know, things like, hey, is this standard-based, is this proficiency-based, is this mastery-based, like what are we working with here? Having a clear definition, this is what this means in Wyoming. And then working with those schools that are already starting to implement it to, you know, through either a, a pilot or innovation zone or, or some sort of learning network that we can have that information to come back and say, oh, this is why this is difficult for schools to implement right now. And then look at making those regulatory changes. I think that is probably the most likely um, thing to help, um, help us move forward in this or help make it possible for schools, more possible for schools to move forward with this. All right, can I just raise a point, or do you mind, uh, sure, Chairman? Right. Um, so I, I do think that the, instead of tripping over definitions, I, I think, uh, um, Senator Ellis, it's what motivates people is we want better things for kids, right? We And, and, it's, and things are going well for kids in Wyoming, by and large, but not as well as they can be going. And so this is a way to say, this is why I say, you know, let's talk about these critical skills like, uh, like you know, deeper thinking, uh, collaborative uh, problem solving, et cetera, et cetera. And, and evidence that kids have learned things deeply without tripping over terms. But then once you do it in these pilots or innovation zones, then you get other people saying, hey, I want some of that, right? And they see it becomes evident in the kinds of works that kids produce. And we've seen some just amazing projects and demonstrations that kids produce that would rival, you know, the students in, uh, in Senator Roth's classes, you know, as high school kids, they would. So they're, they're it's really pretty amazing. Okay. Um, Carla, would you like to add on to that? I just wants to correct me. So good. You're Carly, you muted. <laughs> hey, you muted me because you knew I was going to correct you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Ellis. I just wanted to dovetail on a couple points and screw some notes as you were talking. Because um, the way states have started has been different as it, as it is with every issue. One of the big issues that some states have raised that Lillian talked about when she first opened is really seeing that that gap. I call it the, the, the gap of false signals and mixed messages where students have been getting barely passing grades and sitting at us for 180 uh, days and get the same degree, but there's these huge gaps. So a lot of states have really seen this as the ability to close those gaps. 
The pilots in the innovation zones in particular, I would tell you one of the advantages of them is it sends a clear signal from the state to schools that we, we, we do want you to try this. I, I could fill your ear with lovely anecdotal stories, but one of them that stands out to me was there was a district, a different state that wanted to embrace personalized competency-based learning. They were making some big changes internal, preparing and taking to the state board and the district attorney said, the state will never let us do this. The state does not want us. So it's even those kind of perceived myths, it just sends a clear signal that no, we really do want you to step out and try to innovate. And I also want to touch on another thing that Lillian mentioned is that to a certain extent, this isn't new, but technology has made it a little bit easier. When I talk about technology, I also like to separate it in two different ways. There's the technology, the kids we're using right now to actually instruct kids, even though it may not be our most optimal right now. But there's also the technology that school districts have that they didn't have 20 years ago to kind of orchestrate learning behind the scenes, right? And to, to craft those pathways and tell where kids really are and what they need tomorrow. So that's more the behind the scenes technology. And the last thing I wanted to mention is some of the biggest, uh, and I am using the word barriers we've seen to this work are what I call cultural barriers. Because in the current system, our system is designed to rank and sort kids there's a valedictorian, there's the kids who get the 4-0 and the kids who get the 2-0. And some of, as schools begin to question some of those, the community feedback can be pretty intense. But again, the state supporting them and, and the state helping school districts craft the message of why this is important can really help school districts take some of these big steps. Okay, Senator Rothfuss, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, just to follow up. All right, go ahead, Senator Ellis. Can you just give us a sense about how long it would take if Wyoming were really serious about doing an innovation in a pilot? You know, how many years do you do that? And then how do you start getting more buy-in? I'm just kind of curious what you saw in other states as far as timelines. And I, you know, one thing I do have concerns about, I think there are some districts that would really embrace these concepts. They're willing to try something different. I think there are some districts, though, that view any kind of massive changes or request to change as, well, but we're already doing a perfect job. We're already doing a good enough job, why change? Um, and so, you know, how you, how you respond to those, that kind of mentality? Um, because I think that anytime we talk about change, there's always this, uh, for some districts, a very knee jerk reaction to, to push back and say, no, we're fine. We don't need this. Everything's working fine. We can keep doing everything how we've always done it. Carla, would you like to answer that? Yes, I'll let Lillian, because I know Lillian has some really good examples of how states have done that in the long run, but I wanted to point one thing out. We did some significant message testing on all of this a couple of years ago, and we found one really shocking thing, right, that people don't like change, and I say that joking, right, we kind of know that. So one of the things that we have found really works for schools in particular as they're messaging this out is this isn't, we call it, it's not the revolution, it's an evolution. It's building off the standards. Really, I'm thinking of that just kind of that, that slide that Scott had in the beginning of this is just building on to all of the great work. Now you're going to develop the profile of a graduate. You're going to have competency. So it's just a constant, constant evolution rather than saying that they're doing a bad job. We're just constantly fine-tuning until we get to all kids. Go ahead, Lillian. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to sort of build, um, I'll actually go back to that North Dakota story because I think it provides some really concrete uh, data for you to think about. Uh, so it took the legislature about a year um, to pass uh, essentially an innovative education program. Um, it went to the State Department of Ed, the State Department of Ed put together um, sort of regulations to implement that program. And then they had the first cohort of district supply. Um, once the districts were selected, it's about a five year process that we typically say to go from, you know, trying to even understand, you know, what personalized or competency based learning is to having sort of that deep buy in and training in place for all the educators to have the culture shift to begin to shift, you know, the learning continuums right by which students are learning and achieving mastery. Um, so, so really that that sort of five year timeline. But even within that, going back to, to the way Carla um, projected sort of these short-term uh, levers and these longer-term, even within that five-year timeline, those districts are gonna continue to wrestle with some of these obstacles, these workarounds, the duct tape, and it's gonna, without fail, come to a head around some of these harder pieces like 
you know, graduation requirements. And uh, that's usually the first. And then, then you begin to see, you know, the assessment systems and the accountability systems. And so it's going to take a long time for an entire state to create those long-term enabling policies to do this work. And then I'll just say, you know, again, using the North Dakota example, um, you know, there was a cohort of four districts and the youth correctional facility um, that's part of that first cohort. And uh, they're just kicked off year three. Well, obviously COVID hit at the end of year two. Um, and uh, in a conversation with the state superintendent of, of education uh, about a month ago, she shared with us that um, parents were demanding uh, for their students to be able, you know, their, their, their children to be able to be in these personalized and competency-based systems because word got out that the students in those districts were weathering the transition of COVID so much better. Um, and that's because of that, you know, clarity of learning objectives, you know, it didn't matter if we had, you know, shifting back and forth between in-person to virtual, it was really clear as a culture there already for students to be empowered, engaged, they knew what they were supposed to be working on, parents knew that as well. Um, so that, that word caught on and now the state superintendent's trying to figure out how to do this for every kid in the state eventually. Very good, very good. All right, Senator Hutchinson. Uh, it's Hutchings, Mr. Chairman, thank you. All right. uh, but I think Senator Rothfuss has been waiting, so I don't mind uh, giving him um, my time and then coming after Senator Rothfuss, if that's okay. That's fine with me. Senator Rothfuss, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hutchings. Um, I do, I've got a couple of questions and just exploring this and how it might work in the state of Wyoming. Um, and Mr. Chairman, one question I have relates to the efficacy of it. And we, we've discussed uh, sort of trial cases. Uh, we know that there are circumstances where statewide school systems are, are moving towards it. The question I have is really from the data standpoint and the performance and whether it has led to significant positive outcomes in some measurable, some something that, that we can see. And, you know, I was paying careful attention to the presentation, trying to glean that. Uh, but the states that are mentioned are states that are kind of all over the place in terms of their performance. Some of them, uh, New Hampshire performs very well and, and uh, others of them don't necessarily perform very well. So I, I don't think Wyoming would want to aspire to be more like some of the states that were mentioned when it comes to education. So I guess the question is, why are we looking to this model as being superior to our current model? And I do have follow-up questions, but from a data standpoint, uh, can, can we be pointed to something that would say, yes, this will help Wyoming. Here is the evidence that indicates it would. Lillian, is that your bailiwick? <laughs> sure. Um, I'll, I'll I'll take the the sort of um, the the sort of first narrative piece around you know what why would a state that's already doing pretty well want to do this? And I think what we're beginning to see um, is a recognition, and this was very much true um, in North Dakota, um, and. There are some pieces that we're starting to see, for example, in Massachusetts, another state that's starting to begin to look at the assessment piece because they know they're top of the nation, you know, on the their MCAS, their state tests, um, but they haven't budged on the national NAEP test um, in terms of closing achievement gaps, in terms of beginning to uptick in proficiency as a state. And they've decided that, you know, it's not it's not enough to just stay good. We want to push for that good to great. And I think that's where you're seeing some of the state leadership in those states begin to say, we've held steady for too long. We want to really try to do something that gets deeper. And the competency-based approach is appealing because it really is meant to close those gaps, right? It is truly an equity driver if you think about making sure that every single student masters all the critical competencies before graduation, instead of saying, you earned a C, enough of a passing grade, it's the end of the calendar year, we're gonna move you on. Um, and so I think that that's really that notion. As, as far as the evidence base, um, so I'll you know refer you back to the, the slides that I shared. Um, that really is, we have a, a team at KnowledgeWorks um, 
that has combed through all of the evidence uh, that has been put out on um, personalized and competency-based learning approach. Again, these are you know, sort of your, your national high standard evaluations, as well as some state and regional evaluations that have been done. Um, and the findings that are, are shared in that slide deck are, are sort of what we have right now. Um, because it is a newer field, and if you dig into some of those studies, you'll, you'll see that a lot of the presumptions are based on the fact that, oh, well, our sample of schools that we were looking at were in the earlier stages of implementation. And so the findings conclude that, you know, while, um, uh, uh, while we're beginning to see positive, you know, gains beginning to tick up, we would love to see these schools, you know, reevaluate these schools in three or five years, you know, once they're deeper into their implementation to see what bigger gains, right, we might see. Um, so, so I would sort of caution you about thinking about, you know, the, the time frame we're in and to, to emphasize that, you know, um, anytime we're investing in learning networks and, you know, as a state that's beginning to commit to this, it's absolutely critical to fold in that evaluation piece uh, so we can gather this critical data and knowledge works and we are deeply committed to that. Um, so every single state, you know, that we're partnering with in a deep way, we are trying to fold in that uh, independent evaluation into everything that we do so that we have those results. Um, and we have an evaluation up and running in North Dakota through our partnerships there um, uh, with West Ed and hope to have some results. Uh, you know, we have some very early results that suggest that the schools weathered COVID well. Um, but again, we're looking for that longer term evaluation. The chair, just one quick thing, if I may. Right, Senator yeah. Rothis. Senator Rothis uh, knows this well. It's it's really hard to establish causal inference in, mm -hmm. in these kind of settings, right? So um, there's so much variability in implementation and quality of implementation. So th this is new um, in terms of studying these uh, these interventions. That's true for any intervention, I mean, education, I would say. And so that's the challenge. But you know, mm -hmm. we think this is a way. And we've seen evidence that it helps move kids to deeper learning uh, more effectively than uh, standard by standard approach. So, but it, the causal inference is not there yet. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, a quick follow up on that uh, and getting up, getting back to the, the explanation in detail, um, the idea of equity and Scott mentioned this in, in his early presentation, uh, equity is really where we excel as a state. And that's one of the reasons why we, we perform well in, in national comparisons. Uh, we're, we're sort of the opposite side of things where, where our equity is incredible, but maybe our top end performance isn't where you, you see Massachusetts performing. So I'm curious uh, a little bit more detail about that. And if there, if there are any other trials or studies that are, are kind of looking at our reverse problem where most people are trying to solve equity uh, we do that well with our current system. So uh, maybe a little more thought there. Go ahead, Lillian. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I, I want to defer back to our um, evaluation team that, that works on the research at KnowledgeWorks and I will get you that answer. But I, but I will say that um, one of the compelling things about the personalized competency-based approach is that it, it, it ensures that every single student has the opportunity to feel challenged and accelerate, right? And so I think oftentimes, particularly in our traditional system, where there are incentives to focus on, you know, the students that are kind of around that proficiency bubble, you know, uh, for the state test, that there's a lot of focus on those students and oftentimes those students who are um, more advanced and need more, you know, an opportunity to go deeper, they don't have the opportunity to, to do so in that particular classroom. And, and oftentimes, if they're fortunate enough to have parents who can seek out supplementary, you know, uh, opportunities, that's how they do it. And what we, you know, what we think about a personalized competency-based system is, you know, every single student, you know, the teacher knows where that student is, the student knows where he or she is, and they have the opportunity to push deeper in the content. So when you think about the grading system in a, in a competency-based system, you know, you might think about it as, as almost a, a scale or, or, or a progression. So, you know, is the student below proficient, um, uh, uh, approaching proficient, at proficient, above proficient, you know, and there's sometimes there's even a fifth one, you know, um, uh, and so every single one of those 
competencies, a teacher can say, okay, you're at proficient, but now we want to push you to the next. We have time. So let's push you to the next. How can you go even deeper on this particular assignment? And I think that's the rigor that's really exciting about this particular approach. But I'll follow up to see if there are any particular studies that get at that, that, that piece you raised. Great. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. A, a different topic, if I may, but I, I think uh, Ms. Phillips wanted to weigh in on that, particularly, if I'm not mistaken. Great, Carla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss. I love your questions, and I wanted to thank you for those, because as Wyoming begins to think about how to approach this, putting that almost that legislative intent component of this is critical, because that really will help uh, schools craft their programs and decide how they're going to go. So having that clear intention from the state is really helpful. And you saw that legislative intent section from the Idaho law. Um, what, however it manifests itself, I think that's a really good one. And I wanna caution you, because the issue that you're raising is extremely relevant, because probably, um, and, and I'll let Scott chime in too, I think the biggest issue that we see nationally in terms of pushback from families or students come from the currently high achieving students and families, because the current system is working well for them. And um, I had one school district here in my home state of Arizona that was moving to a competency-based diploma system. And they got pushback from the local chamber of commerce because they said, well, if everybody achieves mastery, who's gonna be the valedictorian? So I mean, that may seem like a, a FICO, kind of a, something you can chuckle about, but it's reality, right? Because the current system is set up that way that the current kids, as I used to joke, little Carla knew how to work the old system, knew how to, how to get the points I needed to get to get the A's that I needed to get to maximize my GPA. And so it's the kids at the high end that sometimes are the hardest. So thinking through your approach as a state of why you want to incentivize states to do this is really critical. And I also wanted to uh, politely push back on the use of the word model, because it's really not a model. I know a lot of bills that you guys debate as a as a committee talk about curriculum, textbooks, those things. This is not a one and done, you buy it off the shelf and implement it. But the good news of that is because it still allows for, like I said, ample local control to meet the needs of their community. So it's really more of an evolution and a mind shift change. And the state's role is how can we get out of the way? Keep enough guardrails in place, right? To ensure equity and quality and accountability, but really to help get out of the way for their movement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the final comment I wanted to say before uh, handing it over to Senator Hutchings is with regard to what Ms. Phillips just discussed, and, and that's on concepts like grade point average and grading, uh, which come into conflict, I think, with a competency-based learning system um, where we have this traditional mindset of, of trying to get to grades. And, and actually, two of my kids went through a competency-based system here at the University of Wyoming Laboratory School. They switched to a competency-based learning system. So they've been getting twos, threes, and fours, and three fives, and everything like that for, for years. And then they went to the high school. And uh, that switch was actually kind of a disaster uh, because they had this expectation of a learning system that they got used to. And now all of a sudden they need a 92%. What the hell does that mean to them? Doesn't really mean very much to them, but apparently that's what they need is the, is the 90% or, or whatever the case may be. So when we look at Wyoming, and this is also kind of for the committee, when we look at Wyoming and the challenges, even though, as I said, we've got a school in our district that's using this, so it can be done. It actually doesn't fit well within a lot of the things we do. For example, the Hathaway system, where we require a, a specific GPA and, and other things we do where we require GPA. Uh, it's very much square pegs uh, in, in round holes as you try and, and implement something like this. So I'm curious, and then you look nationwide where they, they're trying to apply to universities. Uh, how has this worked for places that have really engaged in a competency-based learning system when that valedictorian doesn't become as meaningful and, and when the grades are largely contrived? I mean, let me take this first, Carl. Um, ahead, so it, uh, Chairman, Senator Rothis, um, I could spend 
the rest of the afternoon talking to you about the problems with grades, as you well know. Um, it's a disaster everywhere you look, right? It's just, it's a, it's a funny game. People pretend that they think they know what these things mean. And so you're right, your kids got caught in this weird transition because the high school didn't have the tools to deal with it in the right way. Colleges generally adjust we have seen that um, nationwide to all sorts of types of transcripts that remember, as you know, colleges want kids who could make it through to the next year, to the sophomore year, and then persist. And they, they want to try to make the bet on the kid who's most likely to have the knowledge and skills and persistence. So they'll, they'll, they, we've seen colleges adjust, but the grading stuff is hard in the best of circumstances. There are ways and we're, at the center continually try to work on uh, ways to uh, deal with grades in a competency-based environment to make them um, to make them more the idea is to make them more meaningful right uh, if you ask people what does a b mean you could ask 10 people you'll get 10 different answers right but hopefully if we if i tell you what a three means and i tie it to a description and student work like all right i know what that means so i i won't rant anymore uh, but it's <laughs> Carly. Santa Rothos, uh, Santa Rothos, I have to, I'm trying not to laugh as well because that question is probably the number one most frequently asked question we get nationally. It's the most frequently um, brought up obstacle, but it's also the source of my anecdotes. So I want to share it with you. About four years ago, I toured uh, about five schools in California who were implementing personalized competency based learning. And anytime I tour a school, the first question I would always ask is, what barriers are standing in your way? And every single time the school say, absolutely nothing. We find a way to make it work for our kids. So I often say, one, that's why we have these great leaders because they have that mentality. It's exactly what you want. But as I began to push in these five schools, they all, and I had to really push them and say, no, seriously, what, what kind of issues are you running into? They all said it was the University of California A through G reporting system. And that was when I discovered that even though these schools had moved to mastery-based report cards and transcripts, they literally had people on staff behind the scenes that were manually transcribing them back into a traditional format to upload. So that whole experience was really the source of that slide. That's when I stopped using barriers because I was asking these schools about barriers. And they're like, no, there's no barriers. But there was this big obstacle they were having to work around that is obviously very inefficient. I also want to tell you and agree with Scott, admissions are not generally a requirement. I used to be Arizona State's lobbyist, and I often say, you know, they get transcripts from China, they figure it out. Scott is absolutely right. But as you pointed out with Hathaway, the real problem is scholarships, financial aid, or even if there's a common application system in a state that requires GPA, class rank, things like that, those can be an obstacle. And tackling these is a really great way that the state can send a signal to schools that it's okay, we want you to start thinking about change. I can give you examples of states that have tried to approach this. I will use my home state, although the solution was actually intended for homeschoolers. Uh, long ago when I was on staff in like 2005 or six, we put one statute in the Board of Regents section that said, I think it said, um, Board of Regents shall, shall ensure fair and equitable access to all universities, financial aid and scholarships to all Arizona high school graduates or stuff like that. That sentence was intended to help homeschooling students. But if you think about that one sentence really means you need to help, you need to make sure that any student, regardless of what school they graduate from or what format their transcript or report card comes in, Board of Regents, you need to figure it out. Well, this, this is a great Mr. Subject. Chairman. Yes. Sorry. I have just a quick, very quick add on um, for Senator Rossis. Um, we did actually have to do some work as a department a few years ago in order to make it easier for homeschooled students to be able to uh, get the Hathaway scholarship. And we were able to work through those issues because they usually do not have a GPA. So um, we have found ways to find that flexibility and functionality within Hathaway before. Great. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good. I'd like to get on to the State Board of Education, this is a great um, subject and I really would like to keep exploring it, but we just need to keep our agenda moving along. Okay, Senator Hutchins. I agree with you, but I had some, uh, just some quick questions. If I can get those answered, I'd 
really feel a lot better about this whole process. Can I go do that really quickly? Yes, if it's quick. Okay, one, where does this fit into our recalibration efforts every five years? And when uh, the second one, and anybody can answer these, uh, the cultural shift you talk, talked about. My question is the educational shift. We're talking about doing things so differently where and how are teachers going to be educated to do these new um, competency-based education efforts? And um, this is from a constituent. How do increased behavioral issues fall into, into this process? And the last thing, where does the Center for uh, Assessment, this whole process, where do you come from? You, uh, you're here with us today. Kari is, is familiar with you, but it seems like, hey, we came into town with a new process and we want Wyoming to jump on board. Where are you coming from? Thank you. All right, who would like to answer those? I, I think Kari's gonna have to answer the uh, recalibration question. Um, I could answer where I'm coming from, but I'll let Kari go first. Okay, sure. <laughs> so, Mr. Chairman, um, for all of these things, as far as a, a direct impact on recalibration, um, it, it, it doesn't have much of a direct impact on recalibration, uh, as far as I can tell. Now, obviously, um, if we take a look at our Chapter 8 school finance rules for how attendance is, is collected or can be collected, um, that, that could have an impact on ADM calculations, which of course ADM is the biggest input into the school foundation program funding model, which is why we are hesitant to just say, oh, we got to go forth and do this. Um, we, would, we would like to do, um, you know, have, have much more input from school districts who are actually doing the work of implementing this on, you know, what, what they see as the best ways to move it forward and, and to make those changes in our rules. Um, and, and also work with the state board on, on, you know, looking at the definition of a school day and teacher pupil contact time, because right now teacher pupil contact time is only the minimum hours that a school is functioning throughout a day um, when schools are, when students are actually in the building. Um, I think we can all agree that especially after COVID, teacher pupil contact time is a little more, a little more than just that. Um, as far as, you know, the educational shift for the schools that have been doing this, so that's what they have incorporated into their the required professional development that they do with their with their teachers every year so they have incorporated it into it that way but that it would be part of um you know doing a pilot program or a learning network so that we could figure out what are the supports that are necessary honestly a lot of our statewide system of support um resources right now you know on professional learning communities um, assessment literacy, a lot of this stuff is already, because the research is moving there, is showing it, are, is already moving towards personalized competency-based education. And, and that's why we're seeing the more and more districts shift to that standards-based report cards, um, because they're, they're seeing that this leads to that deeper learning. So, um, uh, you know, hopefully this would not be a, and like I said, this, we're, not at, we're not at the point of, we or don't think we're wanting to say we need all school districts to do this and do this by, you know, 2025 or anything like that. Um, it's that we are seeing school districts move there and we want to make sure that we have a good framework to help sustain that movement and, um, and make sure that it's, it's having the positive incomes that it's having. And then if we see those positive or positive outcomes, um, then certainly we might look at encouraging more and more school districts to do it. But right now it's, um, it's more just signaling that like that this is how the deeper learning is occurring and if you're looking for that for your students This is how you can accomplish it um, You know as far as the behavioral issues um, This is also the, as I mentioned before with our statewide system of support um, You know many of the supports we we or resources Some of them are around um, MTSS and a lot of the multi-tiered system of support with the different tiers is actually individualized or personalized learning. Um, and so I think once again, it's making sure that a teacher is following, whether that student has behavioral issues or not, that teacher knows exactly where that student is at academically and is then customizing that instruction to make sure that they can get it. Um, it doesn't matter if they have behavioral issues or not, we, we know exactly where they're at. And how to and how to move them forward. Um, and then, as far as Scott Marion's involvement, he is actually a former assessment director for, in the Wyoming Department of Education. So he served uh, many years under uh, Judy Ketchpole as, when she was state superintendent with uh, Joe Simpson as the deputy. Um, and they are just a, a national renowned. He now is in New Hampshire, where um, he is a nationally renowned 
um, expert on assessment and balanced assessment systems and summative assessment systems. Additionally, he chaired the assessment task force in 2015 that the legislature um, asked to have done in order for us to move away from PAWS into a better statewide assessment system, and that has given us YTOP. So he's very knowledgeable on, um, on Wyoming and how school districts are delivering instruction and then assessing that instruction. And, um, you know, we were at, uh, I was at a I was at two national conferences virtually last week in which Scott was asked to present. So we're very fortunate that he was able to come back and visit with this committee as well. Wow, thank you, Kari. I'm done, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. John Freeman's got a quick comment and we're moving to the State Board of Education and when they're done, then we'll go to lunch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to stand between us and lunch, but uh, for 23 years, I thought that I was involved in alternative education and when I read the, the board packet I said I was involved in competency-based education because I did that for for 23 years and uh, Mr. Marion will probably remember one of my supervisors uh, Jan Shanker who uh, had put a big thing on mastery on that. Um, I think the comments that I want to make real quick is is that the um, we didn't fit in and as long as our district felt that we were dealing with uh, throwaway students, they didn't get in our way. Uh, and we did some wonderful things. We got great training by going to other alternative schools. I went to six different states to see what they were doing. And, and I want to thank my supervisors for, for allowing that. But they didn't like our report cards because we were involved in mastery um, learning. So anybody that got credit in my class had to meet the uh, the uh, standards with an 80% um, standard, but we didn't put a grade on a report card and we didn't put a percentage on report cards. Uh, colleges had no problems with that, but uh, when we started to report data to the, to the Wyoming Department of Education, they had all sorts of problems with that. The other problem that we had is, is funding. You know, seat time was always connected to that. And uh, they didn't understand when I had a student that could get through the material at 80% in uh, 10 weeks instead of eight weeks, why didn't I fail them? Uh, they weren't failing, they just took a long time on that. Um, I, to put it real bluntly is, is I'm a retired teacher, but if I was offered a, a job in uh, a competency-based alternative school, I would take it in a heartbeat, especially if it was part-time students learn. And I had, we were doing this 30 years ago, 35 years ago. I have about a dozen students that they're in contact with me today, talking about how their education at that school was, was meant for them. And, and it really improved their lives, but where it really improved is their children's life. And with that, I'll be quiet, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good job, John. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go to Diana Clapp with uh, the State Board of Education and hear about the profile of a graduate. Go ahead, Scott. Okay. I, I was saying thank you. It was great to see you guys again. I see you too, Scott. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Lillian. Hello. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Ryan. Okay. Diana and Ryan. I was going to start and then hand it off to Diana and, and just a few. And I know we are between uh, you guys and lunch. So if it's okay, I'm, I'm planning on just about an hour of presentation. <laughs> um, first of all, I've been sitting in and listening from the very beginning and so much of the conversation that you have been having, and I appreciate it so much for your thoughtful questions and really digging into these two areas is what is sort of the motivation of the work that we're doing as a state board. Um, uh, here in Sheridan 2, where I taught, we've been mastery based for a while. We have standards based report cards, K-8, high school does create some unique challenges. Um, and, and so it's that approach that motivated sort of my approach to the computer science standards, which led to where we are with profiles of a graduate. I think Senator Rothfuss, you asked, how do we signal what is important within our content standards when talking about suicide? And, and that's what we're trying to get to with our, our work to have better definitions of what is a proficiency standard. We are trying to signal what is important because 
as we talked about uh, at our last meeting or your last meeting, not mine, uh, we have all of these standards. So how do we signal, how do we set that beacon of what is important to ensure mastery, not just that teachers teach it, but that students master it. And that is where our district assessment system is, is really working towards. I, I, I don't th think we are in kind of that one model. I, we are transitioning to a more competency-based education system here in Wyoming. And the profile of a graduate work is really to set that the big ideas so that we can start to have districts uh, better aligned to that. So I'm excited that in some of the ways we are, we are trying to address both of these issues as the state board and, and improve our system. Um, specific to the work of profile of a graduate, we, as we've said many times, we believe that it's, this conversation is valuable when there's more people a part of it. And so we've been working hard to kind of lay the foundation to lay the foundation. We've been working hard to have a working group, a diverse working group, which Diana will talk about, who will set the questions, set the meetings, and will drive the conversation forward. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to get at is what do we want our system to produce? There's those skills that, that have been mentioned quite a few times. We obviously want them to be healthy and, and alive. We, we want them to be able to uh, graduate more than just knowing some algebra, but also how to be productive workers and great citizens. And so that's a lot of components and it's not just the state board that has the answers. We really do believe uh, districts and and other members have already asked these questions and have, have some wisdom for us. So uh, um, I think in your packet, I won't go through it. We, we've kind of lined out those three phases officially. We are right at the start of phase one. Um, and just to let you know, I know budget's a big issue right now. We, we did do some bidding to see what it would look like to have someone guide us through that. And ultimately we decided that we could do it in house with with Diana working in partnership with the department and WSBA kind of this is a, a joint effort and by doing the work together we think there's a lot of secondary benefits and so uh, I'm really proud of of where we are right now Diana has been doing the a lot of the heavy lifting to get this going and so with that I will turn it over to Dr. Clapp to tell you exactly where we're at. Good morning Diana. Good morning, I'm Co-Chair Northrup. Nice to see you, greetings, greetings committee. I'm Diana Clapp, coordinator serving the Wyoming State Board of Education. And I am going to stay on script here so that I, I can move this information forward for you. Um, as Mr. Furman shared, the State Board determined at least early at this beginning process um, to enter the work utilizing the knowledge and capacity within the state and in collaboration with the Wyoming Department of Education. Chairman Furman shared uh, when presenting to this committee actually in September that there was a question on the state board as to whether there was an appetite in the state for this conversation regarding high school graduation and addressing the state board's identification of graduation standards. I can tell you that the board is receiving not only interest, but multiple opportunities offers to help with the process and move this conversation forward. In May, Susan Patrick from the Aurora Institute met with the board and discussed redefining student success through a profile of a graduate. And a profile of a graduate, as we heard today, that beacon is that it results in a visual or a graphic representation of what graduates should know and be able to do, such as Dr. Marion shared with you um, earlier today. What the board recognizes is that the process of developing the profile is where the learning and considerable benefit of, um, comes from. So by working the process collaboratively with Wyoming schools, communities, post-secondary and business and industry, the board desires to capitalize on the learning, the innovation and the networking that this process offers. It is the process and the profile development that will inform the state board's decisions when addressing their duty to identify graduation standards. In addition to looking at the capacity within Wyoming, the board is also looking um, regionally and at national efforts as well. Gretchen Morgan from the Center of Innovation and Education continues to stay in contact with us and has offered to meet with us monthly informally to offer suggestions 
um, from their experiences in facilitating this type of a process. We are also reaching out to the National Associate Association of State Boards of Education uh, for examples and processes from used in other states. An outline of a three phrase, phase process is included um, in a link in your handout today. We are at the very beginning of phase one as um, Mr. Furman sh shared. To date, a design team is being pulled together. An overview of the role of the design team is also linked in your meeting handout. In reference to um, our previous report to this committee, and I'll, I'll point out Representative Pipperinen and Representative Freeman, on that design team, we have included elementary and middle school representatives, as well as representatives from post-secondary. This design team will hold its initial meeting in December. However, some groundwork is being laid. The board has formed a business subcommittee specifically to network with Wyoming business and industry. The committee is disseminating an introductory letter, which you should have recently received. The business committee contact list will reach 22 business associations or business related organizations, 46 chambers of commerce and 54 rotary clubs. And I'm sure there'll be more added to this list as we move forward. Other potential stakeholder groups currently included is a list of of course the 48 school districts and 117 educational or teacher associations including early childhood and a broad list of organizations providing services to children and youth in Wyoming. Understanding the design team has not held its um, initial meeting yet. The board has though directed that um, during phase one, that we must include collecting information and hopefully some indication of effectiveness of some of the efforts already underway across the state. This may include existing graduate profiles, school capstone projects, community service requirements, or some of the competency-based experiences school districts are already engaged in. We've heard, also heard um, of multiple CTE efforts and post-secondary study on employability skills. So we want to begin the collection of all of this data, utilize and be efficient with um, collections that are already in place and really kick off this conversation across the state and, um, and learn from the experiences. There's a caveat around this and that we're in the middle of this pandemic and with COVID. And the board has also been interested in saying, what have we learned? What are the lessons we've learned or are learning while we're in this process about um, students and about their performance and about delivery of instruction to our students? I believe I saw Chairman Furman may have, did I see? Your hand raised for an addition? No, he says no. Okay. I, I went through that, I stuck to script, Coleman, uh, uh, co-chair Northrop, um, given time. So would certainly entertain any questions from the committee. Oh. You're muted, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So where did the idea of the profile of the graduate come from? Was that presented to you or did you guys pick it up or how's this evolution? So it, 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 the genesis really came out, if you follow it all the way back, the computer science work uh, and our questions about how to identify what was um, for efficiency and, and if that meant for all the standards or for a subset of standards, knowing that many districts would prioritize their standards. And from that, the attorney general ruled that we need to have graduation standards also identified. Um, and that's a big ask for the state board. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a conversation before we had that specific conversation. And, and there was a lot of input around profiles of a graduate. I'm not exactly sure where the, the idea for, for the language or exactly the work came from on the board, but we decided that would be the first best step would be to gather what we already are doing, gather what's already working in the state and have a have a big conversation about what we want our system to produce. Knowing that as we backwards plan from graduation standards or graduation requirements to our standards, to our priority standards, 
those all work backwards backwards to what gets taught in our kindergarten classes. So it's really trying to backwards design what we, we do, which is the approach we have as teachers, right? We take our standards and work backwards. The question we have as the board is, why those standards? Where did those standards come from? Um, what are they leading to? And then, so that's the conversation we're trying to have. Very good, thank you. Go ahead, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think um, Ms. Clapp mentioned something about a working group. I'm curious to know who's serving on that working group. How many individuals are they, um, just the variety of who's on there? Um, Cause I think a lot of times we tend to just ask people that work directly in dis school districts or with schools and then, you know, governmental entities and those voices are important. But, um, you know, my understanding of this conversation was it was going to be much broader than that. So I'm just curious who's on the work group. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Co-chair, um, Senator Ellis. Um, thank you for that question. The design team has 17 members currently um, agreeing to serve on that on that committee. Um, and in your handout, there is a link to an overview of that design team. So I think a key importance of this is that the design team is intended to oversee the process, help build the networks so that we can get that broad voice involved. Currently we have uh, members on that design team from education associations, school board member, uh, secondary principal, as I mentioned, the elementary middle school principal. We have a representative from the governor's office. We have a legislator. We have um, the Wyoming Business Council. Um, I'm trying to think some state board members. I don't have the full list. Um, I, I have it, Diana, if I you can. You have it in front of you, thank you. Yeah, University of Wyoming, the Community College Commission, um, WEA, the PTSB. So it, like as of right now, it is heavy for education, but the design team isn't to design the standard. It's just to design the process for expanding the conversation. So it's that balance between nimbleness to arrive at, at decisions and then, and then expanding it out to really capture that conversation. Follow up. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm just this is something we struggle with all the time is, you know, how do we get parent voices, student voices and business and industry voices? Is there a process to allow additional members that volunteer that want to serve on this? And I am curious who the legislator is and how they were selected. Um, and that's just a structural one, because I know we've got to be sensitive to having, um, you know, legislative committees versus executive committees. And if this is something that was undertaken um, through the executive branch, you guys are all members of a state board. Um, just we need to be sensitive to that too. So um, if I have a constituent or people that wanna be involved, how do, can they be involved and how do I um, get them engaged in that design team? Just so that I think they bring their expertise from the private sector to a process. Go ahead, Ryan. Well, Diana, do you wanna talk about process for that? Um, Coleman, co-chair Northrop. Um, Senator Ellis. Um, yes, what we have is we have facilitators, including members of the of the state board that went through the list of potential people to serve on this design team. And of course, immediately it exploded into a, a very large group. So trying to manage um, broad representation, but also keeping it a manageable group. This is the list that um, that we came up with. One of the things that I, I would point out, and I think you make a, a real excellent point about the variety of voices is I mentioned the 117 stakeholder groups, um, communities, rotaries, business councils. We want a very transparent process. So it was already discussed Would these design team committee meetings be open to public if they wanted to sit in and listen in. And I can't speak fully for the design team in that final decision, but I would, I would stand and we've discussed that, yes, we want transparency. This design team will serve as a means for us to be able to show that, get the word out and show that there's a transparency and an, and an inclusiveness. We anticipate, again, I don't wanna speak 
too far ahead for the design team, that there will be multiple listening sessions, meetings with any organization that requests us to join their meeting or to share information, as well as a way to collect digital information, um, such as surveys um, sent out broadly across the state. I believe your other question was the legislature legislator who's agreed to be on the design committee. Um, that is Senator Cost, who has a, a background in education. But as you see in your handout, we've also extended that if there are other legislators who would like to sit in or come on board when available to join in the conversations for that design team, that invitation is in your handout. Follow up again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, you know, I can appreciate that, but in hearing voices, but I, I mean, at the end of the day, it is about who's on that team. I'm guessing they'll take some votes that have some direction and recommendations. And I think that's where I, I just have the concern that um, when we have these entities, you know, and I know that the, there's a representative, I'm guessing from the business council on there. I just saw business council. I don't know if it's a commission member or a staff member of that. Um, but that's the end, the ultimate concern I have is when it comes down to voting on recommendations and how to proceed that um, there's just a lack of diversity. I mean, those are all government funded positions that are on this, this board um, with the exception of if you have a business council member that has a private sector job, the rest of them are all government employees. So that's my concern, I guess, Mr. Chairman, with this commission. And so if there's a way to add additional board members or members to the design team, I'd be, I'd like to know if that's a possibility for, you know, entities that express interest and would add value to your process. Go ahead, Ryan. Right. Uh, so I, I think, I think you bring up a really valid point. I think our struggle with how, by going to these organizations, we could have them do the work of finding the person to serve on the design team. And when you go to student or parent, um, there's really no one-stop shop to do that. So I do think the voice of, of students and parents is something we are, are very focused on capturing, but you're right that they, they don't have a seat at the design team table. And so uh, taking that feedback, I think that's something we can, we can wrestle with because I would agree. All right, further questions, comments? I have 1235 on my computer. We'll take a, okay. Diane, do you have a question? Um, Co-chair co Northrup, I, I was hoping for just a, a couple seconds, just on a personal level. I wanted to thank um, you, Representative no Northrup, Co-chair Co, Representative um, Piperinen and Representative Freeman. Um, just to thank you, reflect on your service to Wyoming and, and would share that my, my thoughts on that soon went to a very personal experience um, in my formal, former district. And I wanted to share with you all that, you know, um, one particular um, piece of your service was during some of my district's darkest days. And you helped bring healing to my district and my students, um, as well as others on this committee, um, by bringing forward a way to improve school bus safety. And I thought, you know, that's just one small example. Um, of the impacts of your leadership, the impacts of this committee, when your decisions come straight to the classroom door and impact the lives of students. And I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to just express my gratitude for your passion and service to Wyoming's children. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Senator Ellis. Mr. Chairman, did we have anyone else in the waiting room that wanted to testify on the profile of the graduate or competency-based learning? Um, there's public comment. I was going to take public comment after we eat. Okay. I just so, didn't know, Mr. Chairman, if you were moving on or, or how that was going to work. Nope. I was in the process of explaining that. Um, so we're going to take a 30 minute break. I have 1236. That means that at 105, we're going to be back here. We're going to have a 30 minute lunch. It's going to be a shorter lunch, but we'll get back and get after it. At that time, we'll jump into public comment and then we're going to go to. Um, University of Wyoming governance. So that's where we'll be. Thank you. Thank you.